And so we're live, everyone. Welcome to episode 11 of Wrist Shot Week. It is just fantastic. Thank you all for being here. And I just want to double check and make sure that everything's synced up. It looks like we are. Sweet. There's so many. There's already 50 of you waiting. <laughs> Welcome. Let me start from the beginning and say hi. There's a few questions addressed to me. Tom Austin, Dan, great to have you. Clive, great to have you here, sir. Rajiv, uh, I saw Blue Shirt, great to have you. Maynard, Demetrius, it's a pleasure. Your cover photo we will get to in a second. And a few more underachieving watch collector, Hamilton Juan, and many more of you. Welcome. This is going to be a lot of fun. Wrist Shot Week, episode 11. We're looking at sports casual watches. What does that exactly mean? Well, you'll understand when we get to it. Let me know if you can hear me. I think that's a good start. Can you hear me? Comment one, as our usual call sign goes. And just as normal uh, housekeeping is uh, the situation, this is the video that came out this week. Uh, episode 11. Yes, just like yesterday was episode one. Great, you can hear me. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so this was this week's video, very basic and plain, all about our man Francis Chichester and his very interesting Rolex Oyster Perpetual. So if you are uh, watching this show as a replay, uh, you'll see it linked in the corner. I'll put a little drop down thing for you to have a look at. Great video. I love looking at the history. And it was a nice story to cover. Some actually mentioned it was a bit of a documentary. So that was that was pretty charming. So let me just get this list up quickly. Uh, always show a sidebar. Cool. Okay, so where do we begin? There was a question about last week's live show. I took uh, a week off last week, <laughs> which was quite a nice change of pace. And I could have taken a month off, honestly. Uh, but I know you guys love the show as much as I do. You love you love seeing what comes out, whatever it is. So I have to oblige. And everyone else who's joining, Flip and Zippo, Dear Artifact, uh, Nico, great to have you, Forbin, Ricky. There's a, there's a few people. I think, Ricky, you're, you're one of the few people who, uh, it's the first time you've ever seen the show. So it's a pleasure having you. Welcome. And we're going to have a good time. If you'd like to get my attention easier, uh, tag me in the chat at IDGuy or hashtag IDGuy. And I'll be able to read your question, comment, whatever else. So let's get into the show. Been doing this now for two minutes as a warm up. And I think I saw Megan was also here. Welcome, Megan. I think James, you and James are probably watching it in the lounge at the moment. Uh, and everyone else. I'm not allowed to take time off. Raymond says, yeah, I know. It's like forced labor. Uh, there was a brilliant comment. I don't know who said it, but basically, I think it was Reed. Reed mentioned in, in a comment once that this wrist shot week is a monster that needs to be fed <laughs> at this point. It's got that momentum. So let's just discuss the, the theme. Uh, sports casual watches. This wasn't intended, but all the pieces that you sent in had a sports element. Or should I say like 85% of the watches we're going to see has a, a sports theme around it. Uh, but the best part is that you've actually modified them in places with straps, with, with rubber straps, leather, NATOs. So we get to see a lot more diversity in this zone. Don't worry, we're going to see Lungas, we're going to see some Pateks, uh, some really nice high piece, high end pieces, as you can expect. But dotted in between, we're also going to see some peculiar brands that we haven't heard of before. We're going to see vintage watches, and that's generally how the show goes. So uh, taking a hit from the wine and starting. Today, it's a Spanish Merlot, or for you cultured folk out there, it's a Merlot. Getting into the chats, there's so many of them going on now. Apologies if I can't reach all of you. I try my best, but that, as it is, this is a presentation, and it's a, it's a struggle half the time. Right. So uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see the list of watches on the display. And the, uh, the nice thing is I've condensed it down a little bit. Normally, there's about 130 pieces uh, or 130 photos that we look through. This time, it's about 110. <laughs> Talk about really condensing it down, you know, to the finer detail. Mia Lo, as Matthew says, from New Zealand. I mean, you guys on the other side of the world waking up at like five in the morning to watch these shows. What possesses you to do it? It's unbelievable. I will never understand. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being a part of the show. And the chats are always the best part. And for all of you watching, I never address the, the broader audience, all of you out there who watch uh, after the fact, and those who are currently watching now who aren't engaging in the chat at all, I need to say welcome to all of you as well, the casual viewers out there. It's, it's so good having an audience that I can show these pieces to. The whole point behind Wrist Shot Week, it's a place where we can sit back, kick back, relax, and look at what everyone else owns instead of what is marketed to us all the time. 
uh, enjoy the Merlot. Thank you, David. And I saw Flip and Zipper, thank you for the super chat. Thank you. Best part of the weekend. Uh, I don't know so much, but it's nice. I mean, it's a time when us as a community can come together and really enjoy ourselves as a group. Um, Underachieving watch collector. I must say, I've had this watch for about three, three and a half months now, and it's still honeymoon period. I cannot get enough of it. So this is this was a photo I took a couple of weeks back. Uh, I was restringing my my fender, and this is probably one of the best photos I've ever taken of this piece, <laughs> just because of the lighting and everything. The the guitar was sitting in its case, and there was just no glare from anywhere else, and it just looks sublime. But this is what I've been wearing all week, and here is. An example, if you don't follow me on Instagram, I try and update people on what I wear during the week or videos that are coming out. So that's something I could maybe, I don't know if it's possible that I can link it in the corner of the screen now, I don't know. You can probably look in the description of this video and you'll, you might find it there, maybe, who knows. But the rest of you, uh, psychedelicide, 7 a.m., breakfast can't wait. <laughs> Great to have you. And so it goes, lighting is spot on. Thank you, dear artifact. Like that minute hand. There's so many quirks to this piece. And funnily, we, we are going to see a few of them. We're going to see not only the Spectre edition of this watch, but also the uh, the 300M. Is it, yeah, the 300M. So the modern, the two modern ceramic variants of this piece. And just some amazing stuff that came in at the close of, of yesterday, actually. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but uh, really interesting behind the scenes stuff that we generally don't see up and around. So that's it. Juan, thank you so much. You sent me a lot of watches and I condensed it down to about five pieces for the show. <laughs> so uh, instead of normally looking at the 50 watches that you send in, uh, I've only condensed it down to a few. So I hope you don't mind. But uh, yeah, all of you who are joining, it is an absolute pleasure having you here. And let's get into the show. So my little Seamaster, I cannot stop wearing this piece. It's so versatile for what I do on a daily basis. I just enjoy the hell out of it. But we're going to start with the watch that actually became the cover photo. And this is from Demetrius. It's just your standard Speedmaster Hesselite crystal. But the combination of that racing strap with this watch caught my attention. I mean, how can it not? Sometimes when it comes to choosing a watch for a cover photo, it's looking at the little, the little details that we don't necessarily think about. And this, to me, you just have the stark contrast of the black versus white, uh, the polishing on the case, the finishing. It looks so good. And when we talk about, you know, covering sports casual watches, how's this for an example? Especially this time of the year, you know, it's summer in the Northern Hemisphere. It looks so good. I've never seen a combination like this before. I must say, Demetrius, you really nailed it with this combo. And you sent another shot here, I think, in a bit more direct light. So we get to enjoy that contrast. It's a little bit out of focus, but it looks just great. And a Hesselite crystal, notice the biggest bonus. There's no reflection on the glass, and that's what makes them so ideal. There's lots of factors that play into you know, acrylic versus sapphire. One big bonus is that you never have to worry about any kind of reflection. You can see right through it. It's very clear. Yeah, William's saying Omega is great. And, and Nico's saying, tried Fisherman's Cherry. It's tasty. <laughs> My unofficial sponsor. Yeah, Fisherman's Friend. I have it uh, on tap, as you can probably hear in the microphone. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's great. Also, rocking cherry, as it is, because as we know, these chats go on for about two and a half, three hours. And uh, speaking of which, next week, I have a guest on the show for the first time ever. And it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to chat about an interesting subject. We have someone who has quite an experience in this field. And yeah, he's a gent. He really is a nice guy. Don't want to spoil the surprise. I'll let you all know later in the week. Um, Juan saying the easiest watch to read the time for me. And it's down to, I've said this hundreds of millions of times, I'm sure you're bored of me telling you this, but it's down to contrast, down to line weight. Uh, line weight is the most important thing, I think, especially with this watch. We've just looked at the Seamaster. We use, we use like very minor definition with those minute track markers, but you see it so easily at a glance. But with the Speedmaster, which is so much more complicated, being able to differentiate all the parts, the, the batons and how thick they are relative to the minutes as well as the minute track running around, the separate subdials with different uh, text types, uh, just the stark color. It really is a beautiful thing to look at as an instrument goes. And to think it's such an old watch too. Uh, you know, the styling is what, we're talking early 60s and even now it looks modern and contemporary. It's one of the best designs out there, even though Rodania was the brand that really used it first. 
as we've discussed before, but uh, still, the Speedmaster name, it's uh, timeless. So, Demetrius, thank you. We're going to get to your uh, your next piece you submitted later on in the show. But as far as cover photos go, I don't think this gets any better. Can you believe we've done 11 episodes of this before and never once featured a professional, uh, just a standard Speedmaster professional? I think we've featured a Mark II, but not, you know, the original. <laughs> it's pretty hilarious. Uh, Showcase Watcher says, hey, everyone, how are we all? Uh, pleased to say I have purchased the Seamaster 57 trilogy. Congratulations. Now, it really is. It definitely is not a watch for everyone. I can fully agree that. There's, there's elements that people wouldn't find appealing. I'm looking forward to doing a year review of this watch and looking at all the details and more, you know, more concentrated areas. But on the whole, for what you're getting, the price you're paying, I mean, it's still running plus, running plus two at the moment. Uh, and I've been wearing it virtually all week. Okay, moving from Demetrius, we are going to jump to a great start to the show. To get my mind wake, awoken, <laughs> coffee is still getting into the brain, so give me a sec. This is a, a selection of pieces sent in by Perez, or Perev, and I want to cover what he sent in an email and just discuss these pieces very quickly. But as, as I start, so everyone is, is chatting away and it's great. Everyone just inter interact and engage. I found out there's a new feature. You can actually look at active participants. How many are there with us? There's about 30 active participants running at the moment in the chat, so that's fantastic. Okay, Forbin Colossus, I missed, I missed your chat there. To, to survive these streams, it says wine, wine weight is important. <laughs> Forbin, wine weight. Yeah, it's, it's a mixture of wine and coffee. See, what happens is the wine mellows you out. You know, it makes you a lot more calm and focused, and the coffee is like that, that kick. So you get the mixture of alcohol, mellow, bit of Red Bull in there, and you're going. You're gunning for it. So let's have a look at these, these pieces here. Now, Perez is in a bit of a, a sticky situation. He doesn't know what to do with the pieces that he, that he has, and he wanted my opinion on the watches, and I thought what would be even better is showing it to all of you getting your opinions on the subject. That's what makes it so much more fun. There's 35 to 40 different opinions of pieces that he could consider. So let's just run through these quick. We have a 40, I think this is a 40 mil, 40 mil Panerai, which is great. I really do like the contrast and size. You notice now next, this is just, this is just interesting. Globemaster on one side and an OP39 on the other. These two watches are practically identical from rival brands. And you can see just how they've approached these two pieces. I think it really is something to pay attention to. And then we move across to the sport side and we see uh, Aquaterra 41, love the orange contrast, and 214270. So we have the two sports and then we have the two casual dress and then we have the Panerai <laughs> as a range. But in his uh, email, let me just list what he says and I'll get to the chats now. I'm off the screen at the moment. Uh, I am walking the path of horology and would love uh, you to look at my collection, attached picture. So he says, as a list, modern sports pieces with no complications, date at maximum. Up to now, I have a hard time with pushes and buttons beyond the crown. Two, no fixed bracelets. I like to change the look of the watch by changing straps. Three, not much color, but kind of missing it. Four, high-end pieces, but not very expensive ones. So far, I don't see myself wearing a piece of more than 10,000 US dollars. And five, I like well-loomed watches and with an in-house movement. I've been wondering where to go from here. <clears throat> Ranging uh, from, sorry, jeez, <clears throat> oh, my voice is already going. That is not good. Hold on. <clears throat> That's really not good. <laughs> I haven't even started the show and I'm already losing my voice. <clears throat> been wondering where to go from here. Ranging from make it smaller maybe a few more complicated pieces, or moving towards adding a piece here from here and there to make it usable more occasions, like formal ones or chronographs. I am lost. <laughs> so far, each step was easy, but now I just don't know where I'm going. Your comments are very much appreciated. Right. So I was really considering <clears throat> what you would do this collection. Sorry, I'm clearing my voice. I don't have a glass of water with me here, so this could get quite gnarly in a second. <laughs> Okay, getting up with the chats again. What do you recommend? As we see a set here, I love the pairing here between the two. The only, the only outlier in this group is the Panerai, but I mean, as far as a, a diver goes, it's great. 40 millimeter, nice contemporary size. It's a great new direction that they've taken. 
uh, with this styling. You know, they're trying all sorts of things to get their pieces a little bit more up to date with the current zeitgeist, could we say? But then seeing, I just love this, the set of having the two white dial Omega and Rolex pieces. I, I just really enjoy aspects like, I really believe that the Oyster Perpetual is one of the true Rolex swan songs. It exemplifies the Oyster case, what Rolex was about prior to the professional, you know? And the only thing that really tells you it's a Rolex, apart from the detail on the dial, is the coronet at 12. Clean, clear, simple, out of your way. The Globemaster made a video about this piece and chatted about how it takes inspirations from 50s, 60s, 70s elements, puts it together into one package as a combination. And I think together, they just make such a nice pairing. This is with the fluted bezel and everything. It's just stunning. And then these two pieces side by side. I mean, honestly, these you know, when you look at the Aquaterra and the Explorer and the Globemaster and the 39, <clears throat> they're basically two of the same watch. And David's saying he should sell either the OP or the Globemaster. Interesting thought. Wow. <clears throat> I think I need to excuse myself and get some water. I'm going to die here. <laughs> this is really not good. Uh, hold on a sec. I need to catch up with you in the chat some more. Come on, fisherman's friend, work your magic. Mm. He's not lost, he's arrived. Okay, I'm gonna have to actually pause this for a second. This is actually terrible. Excuse me for a second, everyone. Uh, I really need to get myself a glass of water or I'm going to pass out here. My voice is already cracking up. <sighs> it's not a good way to start. So what I'll do is, I'm just gonna condense this, I'll mute the microphone in a sec. How do I do that? Here we go. I'll see you in a moment, okay. Right. <laughs> I hope we're back and everything's okay. Did I even mute myself? <laughs> Where did I go? I'm back. I'll just mention in the chat. I'm back. <clears throat> so what happened was, stupidly, I decided to have uh, strawberries and peaches with cream this evening after a very simple meal. And it turns out that you shouldn't be eating acid acidic foods before doing a live show because can you hear me again please tell me let me know in the chat sorry about that delay um but just got myself some water and i think i think we're fixed don't eat acid things before talking because your voice will just go so what's been going on in the chats i really apologize for that that's not not my uh <laughs> not my style but uh, you know you can never be too prepared right so these pieces what do we think sorry about missing all of your chats, it's just it's just ballistic. Loud and clear, thank you, Neil. It's good to know. Uh, <laughs> so it's just I never had a break on the high seas. Yeah, Forbin, that's right, it's true. And he drank salt water, so. Right, so what should we do with these pieces? How can we, there was mention about selling either one of these two pieces, possibly. It all depends. I think Perez needs to expand. <laughs> Don't eat acid, thank you. Uh, he needs to expand a bit more on the watches that he wears and what he doesn't wear. That might be a good starting point. If it was me, it was so difficult. I would really keep the Rolexes and decide between the Aquaterra or the Globemaster. 
probably the Aquaterra I would sell. Uh, it's so difficult because then you have three white dials and, and so it goes. But he does need a, a reverso. I think someone mentioned a reverso is a good idea. Uh, but so let's let's move on from here. Apologies again for the delay. This has never happened before, but, you know, episode 11, what can you say? I'm going to move on next because it's going to be dragging on for this way too long. Okay, let's carry on with the next pieces. Thank you for this, Perez. I don't know if you saw anything in the chats. You might see it in the future, but uh, I've got to move on because we have like 100 submissions to roll through over the next. We've just lost like 10 minutes after I ate acid. No diver, Nico says. That's another option. It's questioning what kind of diver would you add to the selection. I would say move up another step maybe to something like La Suta. I don't know. Uh, maybe even, what's another good brand to look at? See, it's interesting he talks about watches below 10,000 in his price range. And he clearly wants watches that are relatively well-sized, you know, in the 39 millimeter camp. A reverso is great, nice and practical, makes for an excellent sports watch, and he doesn't need a bracelet on it. It's a very good point. Mixes in Florida. Uh, the, the Lamina Marina is a diver. Technically, technically, yes, it's a diver. But I mean, how often do people dive with these nowadays, really? Okay. JLC Glasuto Rigonol says James Conn. I agree. I think it would be nice. Just a JLC in general. It doesn't need to be, you know, it could be a Memovox, it could be a Polaris, as an example. Uh, and that can maybe free up your options. Nation. Okay, I'm moving on from here. Thank you for this, Perez. We have to go to the next pieces. And I've never seen this before, but I do love this combo. This comes in from Adam, a 2010 Seamaster Professional Olympic, red on red. And I just noticed this today when I was checking out the, the photos. As you may or may not know, I, uh, I generally don't look at the photos very deeply before, <laughs> you know, starting the show. I just flick through them. And I just noticed that the Olympic rings are actually at the like, at the balance. I've never seen that before. Uh, nice looking piece, though. I mean, all things considered. 2010 Olympics. So this was just before they did their whole transition to the ceramic. I'm actually surprised. 2010, they did have the ceramic models out by that time. No? Very peculiar. And it has a blue loom shot, which is nice. And I just, I think the color red, the actual execution of the red color was a really nice take on things. Ruby red, we could say. Rose, I don't know. Um, the red Omega is definitely different and cool. Very unique. I mean, we normally always either see it in black, white, or uh, blue. So seeing this combo for a change, nice. And we're going to see a few of these. Some amazing, we're going to see quite a few Rolexes during the show, but some amazing thoughts that have gone into various pieces. I think Mr. C, if he's in the chat, he's sent in a great, great piece. Uh, excellent combination of colors, put it that way. Okay, and uh, uh, Raymond says, this is the Vancouver BC Winter Edition. Vancouver BC, British British Columbia. Is that what BC means? Excuse me. Interesting. Strange, peculiar. Was it, was it Winter Olympics? Uh, yeah, you said winter, winter Edition. Okay, good. Sorry, that whole uh, moment of me going, having to leave and get water kind of threw me. If you don't know, I've got sound deadening in most of the room. And in order to leave the room, I have to take all this... <laughs> the sound deadening off so uh yeah, it was a bit awkward kind of dropped my guitar on the on the floor but it's it's a stratocaster it can take a hit right and there's mention about the tokyo olympic because and from julian because of the whole situation going on now i can imagine it probably will be uh especially when the with the dial the case everything being engraved 2020 okay moving on thank you for this adam we're jumping to alex next with the first of I think one or two Batmans on the show, but this being the OG, the original, by the swimming pool, it's great. And I just love, I think what he's done so well here is just framing the blue color of the bezel with the blue aquamarine of the water. Uh, nice and <laughs> Les Paul, that's it, Tom, you know. Uh, just talking about Les Paul headstocks, the strap fell in the perfect way for it to snap the headstock. Where If you were dealing with a Les Paul, I kid you not, it landed flat on its back. So uh, good to know, you know, strats, Stratch managed to hold their their weight. So what do you think about the, the standard Batman with the, the oyster bracelet, polished center links? Does it work as well as the Jubilee? When this watch was first released, I said to myself, this on a Jubilee would be amazing. But seeing it now in this configuration, it's it's rare. You don't You don't see this anymore. Uh, nowadays, it's just jubilees everywhere you go, and that's the new trend, which is pretty, 
pretty amazing. Uh, okay, I love Vancouver. 50 fathoms might fit, Clam Walker. 50 fathoms is quite a step up, though. We're talking like 40, 45 millimeters. I don't know if he's ready to jump from 39 to, to 45. That's a little bit of a leap. But maybe uh, what do the, the 50 fathoms bathyscaphs, aren't they 42? Don't know. But there's so many thoughts. I mean, watching this show, you can get a lot of inspiration behind, you know, what, what appeals to you for sure. And I like that one better, Jeb says. And it's just because I think it's, it's a little bit more simple on the eye. The complexity is left on the bezel and on the dial. And the rest of the watch is pretty, could we say, streamlined. Um, nice combo. I really enjoyed the fact that it's being worn by the pool where these watches should be used. Let's not talk about Les Pauls. A uh, bit of an unpopular opinion, but I like the Batgirl, Neil says. I, if it was me choosing between the two, I would probably go for the Batgirl too. I hate the expression Batgirl for the watch. I mean, really, where do these names come from? Uh, they bat, they, I would say, yeah, in general, combinations are great. Let's talk, what's going on with the Les Paul? Peter Green. Yes, Eric Bell, you're right. Peter Green did. And his 59 Les Paul went to Gary Moore. And I think Gary Moore gave it to... He gave it to someone else, didn't he? Bernie Marsden. Was that was that another another piece? I, you know, I, I struggle. Math is 43 and 38. Thank you for that, Tom. Okay, going to move on through. Confidence in the Oyster case is so empowering. It's <laughs> a good line. Uh, okay, and this. Thank you for this, Alex. Uh, we're going to move on next to Amin. Now we might know Amin from. I like the Batman man. <laughs> Shot in the dark. It's great. Uh, Amin sent in. A gorgeous Mosa a couple of weeks back. If, I'm sure we remember. I think it was a Mosa Pioneer. Yes, I'm sure it was a Mosa Pioneer. He sends in something a little bit different this time around. And with the quality of his photos, we get to really enjoy all of the details. Marine chronometer. Breguet Marine. Reference. Hold on to your socks. Holy smokes. 5817ST slash 12 slash 5V8. Rolls off the tongue well, very eloquent. Amin just checked in, great to have you. We've just reached you. So what do we think of the Breguet Marine? I made a video about the Marine, geez, six months ago maybe, and recently about uh, Marine chronometers in general. And I love how Breguet has taken this line and trying to incorporate their you know, Marine heritage into the piece in various places. The one element that I love the most is the crown guards looking like a propeller from the side or, or a prop, should we say, from a side view. And all these little things, like the finishing on the dial. I mean, look at it. The blued elements, the Breguet hands. It looks classical. And that's really the idea. I don't know if it has, hold on a sec. I don't know if it has a, I'm sure it has a pocket watch, uh, coin edge bezel, coin edge, should I say, case flank. But it just really does look like a watch from the time. So they've taken those classic inspirations and made it into something, we could say transitional, relatively modern. Uh, big date at the base. Look at the the brushing on the on the dial itself. That's just something something fascinating to look at. One thing I really commend Breguet for a lot is that they don't hide away from the fact that their past designs have been so influential. And instead of going, you know, making catching up with what everyone else is doing in the industry, whether it's you know nautilizing everything, they stick to what they know best and what they've always done. It's quite amazing. Great bit of heritage behind their designs. Uh, I love the Breguet Marine. Big date incorporated so well. That's a great point, Mena. Uh, the watch manages to use Roman numerals without looking too dressy, which is nice. Yeah, it's, it's, and I think it's also down to the idea of having crown guards and these thick lugs that make it look almost like a sports watch. Sports casual. I mean, this fits the bill perfectly as well. And he also, of course, sent a movement shot that we can enjoy. And you know when you're getting a breguet that you're getting quite a special movement. And look at these shots. I just can can you believe the finishing on this rotor? Question is, is it better than a travel clock? Uh, that's open to debate. <laughs> how many? So adjusted in five positions. I can't see how many jewels is in the watch, but it looks so, so gorgeous. Maybe if I turn it sideways, is that better? No, you want to see that rotor. Hmm. Love those bridges. Beautifully finished, and uh, another reason why you buy Breguet at the end of the day. So, uh, catching up, I like that the, the label, the dial with the movement number. Oh, good point, Rich. Thank you for that. Great to have you here as well. 
the movement number being printed on the front. I never knew it was the move. I thought it was down to the actual reference itself. I didn't know it had to do with the movement number. Thank you for that insight, Rich. And yeah, as a combination of, of parts, it's something quite unique. A watch not for everyone, for sure. Talking about the, the marine line, they've, they've gone into a different direction at this point with some of their pieces, a bit more integrated. I think I did a video on the titanium that they've just brought out. I really like it. I like how it straddles the line between modern and old school. Uh, but this is a lot more in the ballpark of looking at old school elements altogether. But as a package, great looking watch. I don't even know. Is it steel? Is it white gold? <laughs> I don't know. Megan saying she's back. Don't worry, Megan. We all had a break earlier on. <laughs> I uh, almost lost my voice. And we're not done yet with the men because he also sends in a Gerard Perigo, another tongue tire twister, world time, WWTC 49851. Got to say they have the references nailed with these watches. What an interesting combination. I haven't had a good look at this piece, but look at where the crowns are placed. So one being to adjust the, hold on, I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that one is to wind the watch and the other is to adjust the hands for the time zone. But looking at it and the strap combination, I'm pretty sure this is all aftermarket and how he's addressed the, the finishing on the dial with this you know, distressed leather looks so good. And this is really high horology when you're talking about watch design and movements and the caliber of, I'm seeing double and says, it's such a peculiar way of placing crowns. Never seen that before. Uh, having this combination and seeing just how complex it is for sure, it being a very high-end watch, but at the same time, it looks so casual on a strap like this. It looks terrific, really is. World time, any watch with a world time complication, you know you're dealing with something truly special. Okay, uh, Megan, beautiful watch, amazing finish. I don't know if you're talking about the Gerard or if you're talking about the Breguet, but yeah, they're both stunning. And Robert, don't worry, you haven't missed out too much. I. Uh, I had to skip out on the show for a couple of minutes. Uh, Forbin saying, appeal to men rule. Watch name must suggest comic characters, drink or derision, Hulk, Pepsi, root beer, Batgirl. <laughs> and that's it. I mean, it's, it's definitely, we know that the watch space is, is a man's game for the most part. Uh, we have a few ladies who've submitted watches for the show, but it's, it's incredible. I think my viewer rate at the moment, it's like 99.3 male. 0.7 female. I mean, the YouTube algorithm is that good. So <laughs> it's uh, it's pretty something. And Rajiv asking about the 5112. Ooh, I don't know what that reference is. Patek, Patek 5112. I can't, I can't think of what that piece is. Is that a Calatrava? I would imagine it's Calatrava. Next week, we're going to have an open-ended show, a lot more open discussion. We're going to have a guest on the show. So we'll be able to chat in a lot more detail about pieces individually. I want to keep I want to keep the show focused on the pieces on the screen just to save me a bit of energy. <laughs> and uh, Zane's in the sh chat, welcome. Uh, that's how old Patek World Times were done with two crowns before they had the design, before they had the design to push buttons to advance the hour hand. Interesting. Okay, and I'm missing all of you again, as is always the case, but I'm going to carry on through. Amin, thank you for sending these in. I do really love your taste in watches, whether it's Moser, whether it's you know, just seen Breguet's. Keep sending them in. I'd love to see that Moser again. That watch needs to be a cover photo for the show. Has it been before? I can't remember. Okay, carrying on. Now we're going to hit another big gun. This is from Ant. Now Ant, we've actually looked at his collection before, I think. He's got a gorgeous El Primero. He picked up a, a root beer. He also has two Pateks, I think. No, he has, a, he has a Lunga Saxonia Thin and a Patek 5227, if I'm not wrong there. And he's just picked up a reference 15300 ST Blue Royal Oak. I think this has just arrived into his collection. A new edition. And yeah, it's a stunner. It's, it's the most polarizing watch out there. Uh, what a tease. Who is the special guest for next, for next week? Um, he has a YouTube channel. He has quite a lot of experience in this industry. Uh, if you follow him, he had an interview with Magnus Walker over this last week. And... You know, we have such good banter together, I think, as, as a collaboration for a show. You'll really enjoy it. For the first time, you'll hear me talk to someone else, which is also cool. Uh, and we're going to be talking about a very specific theme around Grail watches. So, yeah, look forward to it. It's going to be a different approach to Wrist Shot Week, for sure. 
And going to carry on with all of you in the chat that I'm, I'm missing you all here. Oof, it's just the, the chat's going wild and wonderful. The size is perfect, the 15300. And that's an interesting point. This watch, does this watch measure? I don't know well enough. Is this like the 15202? Is it sitting in the ballpark of 39 mils? And then the 15400 has bumped up to 41. Uh, James Conn, uh, yeah, you're right there. So uh, does this mean that this watch is actually sitting at 39-ish mils like the Jumbo? I just love the fact that the, the AP logo is at the top. It's so clear and clean. It's, it's interesting how they've approached their design to these pieces. Do you prefer a running seconds hand or no seconds hand at all? You know, those little aspects. It's 39. Thank you for that, Ant. That is a great size. So this watch would technically wear like a 41. Uh, when you're dealing with, with Genta-inspired watches, especially these, visually it looks two millimeters bigger than it actually is. So it wears like a 202. Thank you for that, Zane. Difference is case thickness. And that's down to the case back being sapphire. So you can actually see the movement with this piece. Or does the jumbo also let you? I don't know. I'm, I'm bad. I'm bad with these references. Apologies, everyone. But uh, as a combination, the 15202 is the faithful recreation of the original jumbo. And uh, yeah, stunning. And just I want to get right into the detail and have a look at the dial. I... I made a video about this. I'll link it in the corner. It's one of my favorite videos that I've actually done on this channel called something like the AP Royal Oak, Love It or Hate It. And in it, I discuss my, my, my love for the design, but also my contempt and what I think about it. You know, some days are better than others. Some days I wake up and say it's absolutely stunning. Other days I can't understand it. But that's the best part about design. Ones like these are the ones that it's, it's like a happy marriage, actually. You're never fully satisfied, but then some days you wake up and you think, how can I not live without this person? You know, it's that, that blend. It's always about yin and yang. That's life. Okay, and thank you for sending this in. Keep sending in your watches. I love sharing them. Next from Angelo. We're jumping into a completely different area. Looking at Omega Geneve from the 70s. And you can clearly see this is a 70s-inspired watch. Uh, don't, he didn't mention the, the, the gold content in this piece. But it's just clear. Look at the case, integrated bracelet. And I love that in tandem, these two watches were made at the same time. You see where the inspirations went, design styling. One day, ID Guy will have an AP Royal Oak. Yeah, Matthew, that's an interesting point. Uh, I, I don't know <laughs> if I ever would, if it would fit my, my daily wear and tear. I want to get into the subject more when we discuss Grail watches, because my opinion on them is going to be very different to everyone else's, which is a bonus. Uh, my guest, his impression is also going to be very different. And it's how we view them, really, as watches to be worn on a daily basis, whether or not. So it goes. Mr. C, thank you for the super chat. I can't wait to get to your watch. I think it's one of the most inspired photos that we have on the show, uh, just because of the colors. And it's a gorgeous Oyster Perpetual. Okay, that Amiga is great. I was going to buy one. I don't even know if it's automatic. Is it? 70s? It's got a day-date complication. I feel like it's a, it's a quartz movement, but you might need to correct me there. And so it is. Let me catch up with all of you again in the chat. Uh, no Rolex, no sex. I love that name. That's hilarious. For me, the Royal Oak and the VC Overseas are the two greatest watches. They, they really are talking points. And it's so important to emphasize that. Instead of them just being watches that are collectible and sought after because everyone... Everyone looks for them. Uh, they really do spark up a conversation. And that's what appeals to me so much about their designs. Uh, Demetrius, thank you for the super chat. You love the show. We love it too. And it's a pleasure featuring you on the cover photo. And Junior, thank you as well. My grail is a Patek Perpetual Calendar. Oh, well, Sam, uh, at the very end of the show, if you last, you will see a grail of a grail Perpetual Calendar. And I'm not going to uh, spoil it. For all of you who haven't seen it yet, who are a part of uh, Discord and all the rest. Okay, Angelo, great looking piece. Definitely a watch from the 70s. There's mention that this looks like an automatic, and I do not know. Someone might need to uh, clarify that to me. Great looking watch, though. 70s inspiration, and I just love how that time period was really the idea of the integrated case and bracelet came from this piece. The real prototype that started the whole development of that timeline. And it's amazing. There's very few pieces out there that has been able to create such a stir 
as a swatch did. It's made steel the luxury material nowadays. What, how many years later? 40, 40 years later, and we now have steel as the desired number one. I'm going to carry on through. Angela, thank you for sending this. Jumping to Anthony, and now we go from AP to Vostok, <laughs> a Soviet era design, Vostok. And uh, what a peculiar looking piece. But what I love, even with a watch like this, it's probably cost you, what, 100, 200 bucks. I always enjoy numerals and batons on a dial. And I'm just looking at it now. The Oops, going back, come back. The, uh, the accents here, they remind you, if you squint your eyes, they kind of look like a radiation symbol with those elements. Strange and peculiar. I can't understand any of the text on the dial. Someone might need to uh, clear up what that means exactly. But uh, to the rest of you in in the chat, I see Nicker saying the Porsche Taycan is the Porsche's oyster courts, I bet. <laughs> oh, that's so, so funny. Yeah, it's great. And Carl, I saw Carl, Carl joining us. Great to have you here as well. So all the regulars, it's always a pleasure having you. You're late, Mr. Bond. Fun looking Vostok. Yeah, it's definitely not for everyone, but this reminds me of my Seamaster. Same kind of time period we can imagine. And uh, I do really enjoy the idea of numerals and batons on a dial. This probably has a tritium loom set up. Whoa, magic mouse, work with me here, sweetheart. Uh, red highlights and accents. Uh, it's basic, it's simple. Look at how the case has been done. So we can imagine this is probably deep in the late 60s, transitioning to the 70s when we started seeing those integrated cases. And I'm going to refresh the stream on my laptop. This is a little bit delayed. Let's see what you're saying. I think I just saw Mark P joining all of us. Ooh, Mark, I really wanted to feature your new watch. And it's sad that you haven't taken the stickers off yet, but we're definitely, definitely going to highlight that in the next show. I kind of wanted to be the cover photo just to celebrate what you managed to do over this week. Mark picked up an amazing piece that many spend their lives seeking and he's done a great job let's put it that way okay thank you for this anthony and i think he sent something else oh no what so i called this zodiac seawolf uh i think i think you might have oh dear i think you might have double sent me <laughs> you might have double sent me this piece and title maybe i did that i don't know but uh as a combination you get to see the elements here you've got some beautiful rust on the seconds hand just corrosion in the purest form. Looks like there has been some water uh, ingress, that's a good word, no, uh, around the dial itself. But as a combination, it's quirky, it's peculiar, it's affordable, and that's just the fun of it. You can see this watch has been well worn in its life. Next up, this is a watch that I wanted to talk about earlier on, actually. Reed sends in, and Reed should be in the chat, a Mont Blanc Heritage with a salmon dial. And what makes this so great is that next week there's going to be a video all about salmon dial watches. I feel like they are grossly neglected on this platform and hope to remedy that some way. Discussing why they are popular, rare, sought after, it's a long video and we look at a huge breadth of pieces. I must say the, the Mont Blanc uh, variants of pieces, they have the Heritage Chronograph, they have this gorgeous mono pusher as well. There's something about salmon dials, what it evokes as a color. And I don't want to, it's not pink, it's salmon. Flippin', you're right. Uh, did I say pink? I, I do flip between saying pink and salmon during the video, so excuse me. But uh, there's something about this color, and I do spend about four minutes discussing what the color really evokes in our you know, deeper psyche when we look at it stylistically. I also go so far back to talk about where the color pink uh, became popular and how it did and yeah, it was a lot of fun a little bit quirky and different and peculiar but that's how the shows normally work how the videos go and all of you here in the chats again I, I am absolutely useless with catching up with you again tag me in the chat if you want to get my attention otherwise I have to roll with these so he was trying this on at an AD I think I remember and just look at that color and one element that I do highlight is that it blends so well with a with a skin tone whether if you have a fair skin of course uh, and it's just a character also like noticing the the brushing on the inside and the more you know sandblasted effect on the outside i really think it's a win they've done a great job I mean, we don't we don't assign mont blanc with with great watches really we assign them with pens and other luxury goods but as far as how they've addressed 
the the essence of 40s inspired salmon dial pieces with hobnails and again the, the numerals at the quarters i love it it's a real classic inspiration and yeah great looking piece thank you for sending this in reed and peachy as tom says <laughs> uh, looks more golden than salmon the color the color reacts so well in different lights and i hope to address that in the video we look at so many pieces from different families and just how they address the tone there is no actual distinct salmon color in the industry it's it's all over the shop sometimes you have a bit more copper in the finish other times it's more muted it's more tanned uh, we will see from from ap they they go very like what do we say caramel almost and uh Neo saying, what color clothes would you pair with a salmon dial watch? Well, I do link Great Gatsby and his pink suit. I think that would work pretty well with this combination. Not that it's, it's you know, modern to today's standards, but they are much loved by collectors, as Megan says. That's definitely a talking point. But I love the fact, and the reason why I address so many watches in the video is that I look at these, which are affordable, quote unquote, and how certain brands have tried to capitalize off the styling, make them attainable. And it's so unique for that reason. But of course, we go to the Lungas and the Pateks at a later stage in the video. So that's the way it is. Reed, thank you for sending this in. It's great. We have never actually featured a salmon dial watch on the video, which is on the live show. Jeez, I'm getting so confused. Carrying on. Thank you for this, Reed. Moving to BDev next. And he sends in a Glycine Emin Base 22. Might need a bit more clarity on this piece, but I do know it's modern in every sense of the word uh the, the emin definitely did come with a white dial back in the day when it was originally introduced but seeing it in this configuration i think it's the size that makes it work so well question is how easy is it to read the hands on this dial and to read the time the one aspect about uh the the glycine emin as a piece is that the dial is very cluttered with details and uh, i do love the story about vietnam era pilots just loving these watches because they were so simple and, and affordable to use and they had GMT complications. They could just rock them, you know? Okay. Going to catch up with all of you in the chat. The 5270 salmon is great. Yeah, for sure, Joe. And there's another, the, uh, the 53, Ooh, what's it? The 5335, I think it is. No, am I getting it wrong? 50, 5035. I think that's the reference with the Arabic numerals. Have a look. Uh, Patek 50, it's, it's an annual calendar. Annual calendar salmon dial. Look it up on, on uh, Google. It is such a gorgeous watch. And it really does harness all those aspects that I want to try and address in the video uh, next week. And I saw Forbin mention something in the comments. Salmon dial. See a sucker suit with straw, blo <laughs> straw bloater. Straw boater. Yeah, for sure. Straw boaters. Luckily, I didn't go to a school that had straw boaters, which is a... Uh, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, but uh, luckily I, I skipped out on that. Anyway, going to carry on through. Thank you for this glycine. And from BDev again, he also sends us an old screw, old school. Jeez, I need to I need to hit the coffee or something. I'm I'm losing it here, gents and ladies. A Gruen from 1970. Now, what makes this watch great? Uh, he got it when he was 13 years old, given to him by his uncle. And he still wears it today. Look at the stretch bracelet and everything else. <clears throat> Excellent amount of polishing going on here on the on the crystal. I love it. Something about old watches. From 13, he's had this watch virtually all his life. And I think it's just <laughs> boys high, as Eric Bell says. Yeah, no, definitely didn't go to go to a boys high in that sense. There's a couple of boys highs from where I was from, you know. Uh, but no. My, my college wasn't called Boys High, it's for sure. Uh, it's funny, I think Eric might be onto something, though. It's, it's good. It's pretty much my rival, my rival competitor school. So it's great seeing this piece, you know, a classic, a real old-timey piece, manual wound. I would imagine it has to be manual wound, right? And it just, it just is simple, basic, low-key, and it's been worn. It's lived its life. And that's what makes the difference at the end of the day. There is some, there's, there's a passion to the watch, even though it probably cost what, a hundred bucks. It's that tie to the past that you now have with a piece like this. And it's pretty priceless in that sense. Giving this to your son or your daughter. Ah, but do I play cricket? No, I never did, Carl. Me and cricket, I'll, I can talk about that in a sec, actually. Good, good point. 
Thank you for this, BDEV. I think I saw you in the chat. Automatic, it is. Sweet. Gruen is a classic. Didn't they feature Gruen in Mad Men? I'm pretty sure this was a watch that was featured uh, in that series. And <laughs> Oxley stayed high. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Moving to Blaine next. Now, there, there are a couple of uh, very peculiar watches that we're going to have a look at that I have never seen before. I've never heard of the brand names, and this is one of them. From Blaine, he sends in a <clears throat> Kentex Pro, 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 Gauss, Pro, Pro Gauss, Pro Gauss, anti-magnetic. Uh -huh. So it's a Pro Gauss uh, automatic uh, with a Seiko NH35 movement, and I actually love this. I, I, when I talk about the, I'm just thinking about it now. You're dealing with a, a flight qualified instrument. This is definitely a pilot flieger inspired watch. Uh, you're dealing with a brass case, which is something very old school. Being anti-magnetic is so important for a pilot watch because you know it needs to take the pressures and stresses of magnetic fields in an aircraft. So you have a brass case. I can imagine this is, sorry, bronze case and a green dial. So this watch is going to age pretty well. I like that idea. Also enjoy the handset used here. It's it's a clear modern interpretation of a, look at the, the age on this as well. <laughs> these hands look like they've seen some, some life. This is a modern interpretation of a cathedral handset. And it's like a blend of cathedral and sword style. And then you have the very typical uh, pilot inspired, you know, early 1900s transitioning over to the 1940s you know, pilot style dial as well. Nice looking piece. I, yeah, you know, it's, you, these elements catch you a lot of the time. Milgas and IWC hybrid. Yeah, for sure. That's that's what it seems like, right? It uh, looks like a micro brand BDEV. I think it is. Pretty sure it is. Uh, there was some great comments talking about cricket and stuff. Yeah, we can we can discuss we can discuss cricket in a sec. Uh, I didn't actually play cricket in high school, thank the Lord. I played it all through primary school. Coming from the southern hemisphere, it's almost a requirement. And I think I've mentioned it before on the show, actually. Blaine, thank you for sending this. I'm going to move across to Brandon next. We've been running the show for 51 minutes, and we're still on B. That is not a good sign. <laughs> I have to speed up. Now, Brandon, as we see as Mena in Japan, he sends in one of the most explosive dials I've ever seen on a watch for the show. It reminds me of my Fender Strat, actually. Uh, so, yeah, talking about cricket... Primary school, it's, it's a requirement to play the sport. And you have those great days when you bat so well, and then other days where you end up going out first ball, they call it a duck, and you spend all your time on the field. And you just, you know, for me, it was, it was counting the butterflies. <laughs> I was much more of, a, of an active sports person. So with regards to tennis, squash, badminton, a bit of rugby here and there, uh, shooting I loved. I was actually the top score holder for shooting in my school, which was great. And uh, yeah, love, love the stories. I'm a sucker for olive green. Yeah, olive drab. You win me every time with it, I must say. It's, there's just something about it that's so old-timey inspired. It's very uh, acceptable. But this dial, I have to go back to this. So this brand, it's called a, uh, <clears throat> let's get this right, a Vapaus. A Vapaus. Try and get right in. A Vapaus. And the, the underscore is Vorkut. I can't remember. I think he gave me a bit more detail on the on the piece. It's got a VK64 mecha course movement. They are amazing movements. Kid you not, they uh, they function like uh, bulletproof. They essentially are bulletproof. You get the joy of mechanical, but you also get the uh, the accuracy of quartz. It's the best of both worlds. And God, I must say, this dial is so explosive. I, this how they managed to get this effect it reminds me. I mean, I have a a Stratocaster that has the exact same finish. It's just one tone of, uh, of sunburst on the outside, and it looks so, so good. Dead eye. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> uh, funny. Yeah, you guys are great. I must say, the participation is awesome. And next week, I really hope it's going to be even better because we're really going to banter and have a good show. Uh, chatting with someone else on the other end is going to be something very different for these live shows, and maybe it can be a regular thing every you know, once a month or whatever else. Taking a hit of the, uh, I think it's a Spanish, did I say Spanish? Spanish Merlot. And I just enjoy watching the chats when I can, if I can. So, great looking piece. I love the mesh bracelet as well. And that dial is just something else out of this world. I must say it's pretty expressive. 
exciting. Orange highlights as well. Those little contrasts, stunning. Thank you for this, Brandon. But he sends one more. And this as a pairing. He has done, he definitely knows how to pair bracelets with his watches. He's talking about John T. Rhodes. <laughs> yeah, he was. Uh, <laughs> and, and saying Vapaus or Vapau. No, I, I don't know where these names come from, but I mean, I guess you have to give it a name somewhere or other. Now this, the Vulcan Cricket is a classic. And the Spark Watch, as Eric says, yeah, Eric has to jump in with that. Uh, I, I really enjoy the what they've done with the dial arrangement here. Question. When you look at it, though, it does seem pretty cluttered, for sure. But your attention gets lost in the dial a little bit because you're dealing with hands that match the batons on it. And is that something that we could criticize, maybe? But the cricket is essentially a, uh, it's like a memo box, right? It's, it's, uh, it's not a, it's, what's a better way of saying it? It's like an alarm. It's an alarm watch. And it has this, they call it the cricket because of the way it buzzes when it's on your wrist. Uh, but I do really enjoy the bracelet too. Would we call this a barbed wire style bracelet? As a pairing, I mean, we're talking about a watch that was brought out in the 50s, late 40s, early 50s, I think. And as a pairing, seeing these two elements together, you really capture that time. And now again, where do we ever see these watches featured? Mike Proctor. <laughs> oh, geez, I tell you, the, the chats are always, always got razor wire. Thank you for that, Eric. Did I say that right? Spock watch. It's great. Nice looking piece. And also, he seems to be someone who really enjoys the expressiveness of a radially brushed sunburst dial. And Main is saying that it's called a Polynese mesh. Thank you for that. I had no idea. Thank you. And Mena being uh, Brandon, who's watching the show at the moment. Nice looking piece, subtle. Also, the size is great too. Uh, Breguet reminds, uh, numerals remind me of Nomos. What am I saying? They do. There are a couple of brands. Uh, Vacheron also loves this layout. And it's one that works with some pieces and doesn't with others. So yeah, as a combination, nice looking watch. And I love the size too. Not in your face. There's a great understanding of dial to bezel proportions the way the lugs work and how it sits on the wrist, I would imagine it's probably like 38 mils by, by looking at it. Okay, moving on next to Boozer. I don't know if Boozer's in the chat, but he sends in the Hamilton, they call it the Pilot Pioneer, but we should all just call it the W10. This is quite a special watch as far as recreations go. When you look at field watches and the development for the uh, British Armed Forces over the years. Uh, this came directly after the Smith's W10 and uh, did, did it? Yes, it did. I'm sure it did. If I'm thinking of a timeline. And you can see how the late 60s, early 70s case design started seeping its way in. And they basically took aspects from uh, the W10, the, the original, the Smith's W10 and Prior to that, the uh, IWC Mark 11, and I'll put the video in the corner for the, the actual episode. You can see the full development of watches of the armed forces. Uh, but the, the interesting thing is, is how when Hamilton went out of business, so their movements got transported across. I love the fact that the companies collaborated and uh, you had in-house manufacturing back in the day for these pieces. Just a simple field watch that tells you the time and this being a, a direct recreation of the original. I think it's been scaled up a little bit, though. That's the only difference. Nice looking piece, though. Again, on a NATO strap, as we're going to see through the show, we're going to see a lot of uh, sports casuals. And that's what makes it such a fun series. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> I never do. And it just turned out that everyone seemed to be looking in this area. So hitting the water this time and catching up with you in the chat. And Megan's saying, very cool watch. Indeed, love the retro look. Yeah, it does look great. Apologies for the, when I swallow, you can probably hear it in the microphone. I, uh, the microphone's right by my mouth. So it's not the best thing in the world. Uh, okay, moving through. And there was mentioned by, by Ken, Ken Niff saying, it must concentrate the mind if you are making a watch for a soldier. It sure, it sure does. And it needs to be so many things. Great point. You're thinking about legibility. You're thinking about... Uh, functionality, thinking about size and proportion on the wrist, thinking about uh, just wear and tear, how it will hold, hold up. Um, speak into the microphone is a euphemism. Yeah, Hans, it sure is. Moving across, Boozer, thank you for this. We're jumping next to Cameron. 
Cameron sends in, and I'm going to completely wreck this name. <sighs> Here we go. A Guinand. Guinand? That's about right. A 31E. And you can just see those. Funnily, we were just talking about the IWC Mark 11, <laughs> and we get one inspired by those those original aesthetics and you know it's it's amazing how these watches just line up with each other in in the scheme uh, and i love the strap again we see we transition away from leather and we move to what do they call this like a not a sailcloth but it's, it's like a plaited uh nylon i don't know you might need to correct me there elasticord i don't know i'm gonna botch it this looks like a recreation of a mark 11 everything from the shortened hands and i tell you this is not scripted this as you can probably tell but it just so happens that these watches line up with each other. That's an IWC Mark 11 or 15, no date. And that's something else to mention, no date. Look how clean it looks. Look at the presentation. It is just so plain and simple. And there's mention about what size it is. I really, really don't know. And Dear Artifact is saying, <laughs> thank you for that, Dear Artifact. It's pronounced Guinol. Thank you. Thank you so much. Dear Artifact always gives us the best information. And you sent in your dad's watch today, which I really look forward to showing off to everyone. He also sends a shot of the movement, and we can have a look at it in a bit more detail. Made in Frankfurt, uh, Wasserdicht. I don't know what that means. Someone might need, a, might need to clarify there. But the movement looks great, and the finishing looks nice. And I mean, I, I can't imagine this watch is extre you know, extraordinarily expensive. Pearl on strap. Thank you, Raymond. It's a Ur A inspired dial. Sure is, Mason. Thank you. And... I love the fact that they've addressed the finishing well. These screws, I don't know if they're heat blue or not, but uh, you can actually see that there is some finishing on the bridges themselves. I mean, they go so far to engrave their name on the on the movement bridge itself. Uh, nice and clean, clear, simple. And yeah, as a package, I think we're talking about a watch that's Flieger slash, you know, contemporary pilot, uh, military inspired, great combination of parts, no date, keep it nice and simple. Keep it hand wound. That's all it is. The real Zen Mark II, <laughs> Eric Bell. Uh, I don't know what that is. Is this what it's representing? Time Factors makes a Speedbird 3 that looks similar. 73, you're right. Exactly. And interesting, Eddie told me that he's now bringing out a condensed version of these pieces that are going to be much smaller in size for uh, the more average sized wrists, which is great. Let's talk about German. Uh, your German Hans, what does it mean? <laughs> it's great. Uh, okay. Going to carry on through here. Thank you for this, Cameron. Next, we're moving to Cedar Canoe. Now, before we get to a, a gem of a watch that he, he sent us, first, I want to look at this. And he gave me the wrong name for the watch in the email, sadly. Uh, I think we had a bit of a mix up, but I, I, I couldn't find the reference of this piece. So I just called it a Young Hans Tropical. I don't know if that's, that's a good enough expression, but I called it Tropical because the dial does seem to change in different lights. And again, this is a piece that very much has its heritage and history tied into designs just like, oops, oh no, oh no, made a mistake there, come back. Again, have, have designs that are inspired very much by the pilot watch of its time period. Uh, this to be a bit more of a dated inspired reference, more like a, a 40s era. Is this a recreation of an original from the family? I'm as German as sushi, Hans says. Wow, that is, that's great. Where do you guys come up with these expressions? It's amazing. Uh, and Mark, I think you said something great in the chat, but I missed it. Uh, now you're showing your age. <laughs> Don't know if you're referring to me, but uh, yeah, I'm an old guy. I'm a really old guy. So nice combination of parts. Again, we have this funky seven. Good point, watch and pray. You find that with a lot of watches, it's great. It's actually a great practice to adopt. When you're looking at these old inspired pieces, always look at the sevens. Because you can tell a lot about a watch by, I mean, this is real like watch nerdery right now. Uh, you can tell a lot about a watch dial by the way they address the seven, whether it has a serif or not. A lot of the time you'll see numeral arrangements where there are no serifs anywhere except on the seven. And small little details that you just don't, you don't think about at first. A deco dial as mentioned by Eric Bell, for sure. And it's a great looking piece. I mean, look at the size. Again, talking about a watch that's almost, I kind of think, IWC Portuguesa as well as uh, Flieger inspired from that time period. Looks great. Question mark seven. Very good. And that, would they actually refer to that? I mean, look how peculiar it is. 
squint your eyes and look at the dial, the seven looks so out of place next to all the other numerals, but that's just the fun. It's almost like that that's the, the typeface that, uh, that's the elements to the typefaces that they wanted to address with all of these pieces. Deco styling, I think, is a great point. And then we have a look at the movement at the back. Three bar, waterproof, water resistant, uh, 17 jewels, mechanical, hand wound. It's all you need. Steel, simple, elegant, basic. It's great. Great everyday wearer. And uh, with regards to being a watch that wears low in profile, that's small, that's basic, quite utilitarian. Another casual sports watch, we could say. Uh, Matt Marks, join, sorry, Matt Max joining us. Great to have you here, sir. Hope you're doing well. He's mentioning all the different names of everyone in the group. And the next piece from Cedar Canoe that I want to hold on for a second. Hmm. We're looking at a 105.012 from 1965. And this is the kicker. Same reference and year as Buzz Aldrin's watch in Apollo 11. So when we think about the exclusivity of these pieces, how many of them did they make in that year, 1965? They made, of, I would say, maybe 1,500, 2,000 over the course of the year. Maybe someone can clarify it. There's much better Speedmaster enthusiasts out there. But this being the Buzz Aldrin watch, uh, you've got all these little quirks like dot over 90, as mentioned. Uh, small details like you notice there's a main dial where all the subdials are arranged. But there is this distinct step between the main dial and the minute track. That's another aspect that makes it old. Uh, look at the logo, the Omega text and print. The logo is applied. It's another aspect. There's so many little quirks about these, you know, original transitional prof professional models. Uh, and yeah, it's a gem. I love the fact that it's from that same timeline as uh, Buzz Aldrin's. And I was just thinking something that came to my mind this is great. This works so well. Talking about uh, Francis Chichester's Rolex and what it did. Again, I implore you to watch the video if you haven't, because it looks at this such an understated everyday man's watch that literally it went around the world. It was the first watch that accompanied a sailor as he solo sailed around the planet. It took him, it was well over seven months. It was about nine months at sea. And it's just a basic, simple, everyday piece. But I, I, in one of the comments, there was a great comment that sparked this thing to me. I thought to myself, that Rolex is as important as the watch that went to the watches that went to the moon. Aldrin and Armstrong Speedmasters, I think they rank in the same category. They were so pioneering for what they did in their you know, categories. Uh, it's amazing. The history behind watches and what they have done a lot of the time. And as far as I know, they keep that Rolex in the museum in the Rolex Museum. They're very stingy with letting the watch go. But uh, yeah, getting back to this piece, I'd like to know a bit more detail about the loom on the hands and why they've gone this color. Was this re-loomed once or is this just how the loom worked? Did it age this way? Uh, you know, water contamination is pretty understandable from, from that timeline. Yeah, that's just a stunning piece. It's all original. I'm sure we can all agree there. And so it goes. Going to carry on moving through. Cedar Canoe, thank you for this. He sent another one in. Hold on a sec. Oh, nice. Now, we know Cedar Canoe mainly for his love of vintage Seikos. And he sends in a Movado with an El Primero movement base caliber. And one aspect that I love, oh, he's actually giving me the reference to 3019 PHC movement from 1973. You can see this watch is most definitely from 1973. And... Isn't it nice seeing the date at the 12? How do we ever, ever see that combo? Uh, and I see Megan in the chat saying uh, 65 speedy. Yeah, I think she's a little bit behind in the, in the delay. Refresh your stream, Megan, if you want to catch up with all of us. Sometimes there's a bit of a delay and uh, it sucks because the chat doesn't actually delay itself. It's really annoying. Uh, for all of you joining now, again, I've, I've missed a lot of you in the chats, but uh, if you want to direct your comment, Hans saying that he loved the, the video on Chichester, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. It's a story that needs to be covered more. Rolex needs to celebrate that background. And there were more, more sailors that came after him who did even more daring tasks in that, in that area. So, yeah, I'm going to carry on through the chats. Uh, so Triforce, I missed your chat earlier. You said tri uh, Chip Wong successfully shortened so shorted a currency and bought an emerald Rolex with the profits. Holy smokes. Three rainbows are now an emerald. This is getting insane. Chip Wong needs to send in all of them for the show. I'll even, if, if that's the case, if the photo is that well done, 
it'll be the cover photo for the show and we can just we can just chat about it for ages that would be good actually we'll make a perfect discussion around grail watches which is coming up next week but this does look like a zenith el primero dial all the way huge panda uh sub dials you notice the the applied batons that look just typical of the 70s the 70s case all those aspects you just elements that we know and love nowadays uh nice looking piece okay i'm gonna move on through cedar canoe thank you for these and next from our man wisconsin watch guy who we know as chris uh, he is he might be in the chat I did see him i've seen him here before and it's just a basic plain and simple hulk now recently this watch has been you know just pushed into the next realm of collectability I heard rumors that it's been discontinued. I don't know if that's the case. Hold on a sec. Turkey Vulture, did you get a new watch? Hold on. It seems like everyone's congratulating him. And I, I missed the comment. Can someone tag me and tell me what he picked up? That would be good to know. So this watch has been pushed into a whole new realm of, of sought afterness. You'll hear Watchbox advertising this watch as the, the next coming. Uh, issued the theme. I issued the theme. What? Watch guy? Oh, right. So when this is from We Watch Guy, it's good to know. So look at the way this watch catches the light in this configuration. It doesn't look emerald. It actually looks like a much more muted olive drab color. And yeah, you know, I always have my my debate with the way they did the ceramic bezel on these pieces, but in this light, it looks stunning. It really does. It's a very rare one, Nico says. And I mean, oh, gee, we're referring back to the Phillips auction, are we? Jeez, that was that was a laugh. This is a fantastic shot. Wow, this is staying here for a sec. I'm going to tag reviewing Phillips auction in the corner as well because that was a great live show. That was the longest live show we've ever done. It was nearly four freaking hours. I don't know how I did it, how you provoked me to do it. But every single watch that was listed was very rare, extremely rare. And uh, yeah, Phillips needs to sort out whoever was listing these pieces. It's just pure laziness, <laughs> the Kia Aura, as, as, uh, as Shane says. So I really like how he, this is actually, this might be one of the best pictures we've ever had of the Hulk Submariner on the show. Why do I say that? Look at the dial, look at the bezel, look how it plays in the off light. This looks like it's under a tree. So we get to see some, some leaf diffusion on the dial. Notice on the bottom uh, right-hand section, we see the, the radial effect here of how the dial reacts. We move further up, we see the same thing. And then you notice how it goes almost a deep black, a matted black. Then around the bezel, we have this gorgeous, I mean, this is the color that I would want on my Submariner, deep olive drab finish. And then we move to the more direct light and we have this flat, flat green. I just wish they had toned the green down ever so slightly. There's some tags of me going on here. Forbin saying, imagine if they used olive green instead of that shade in the hole. I tell you, it would be for the pedantic sticklers like me, the, 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 the stupid ones who look at these details and criticize them to pieces. I think they would be sold on it too. I would be, for sure. Green on a watch is great. And I think when I talked about this watch, I compared it to the Black Bay Harrods edition and what they've done there. Muted, toned down. This is an absolutely gorgeous photo. Thank you for sending this in, We Watch Guy. I love the combination of colors here. We get to see every, virtually every element that this watch could ever possess in one photo. This should have been the cover photo. If you had sent this in earlier, this is so gratifying. <laughs> if you had sent this in earlier, I think I saved this like today. Uh, this would have been the cover photo for the show, I think. I would have really made it stand out. It's gorgeous. I must say the way it works in the light. This, I, I bash this watch a lot, for sure. I do bash the, the ceramic, but this dial is one of the best dials I've ever done. This and the Milgaus Z Blue, there's like no comparison. I think they have nailed the color choice. The emerald dial is not the part that, that, I, that irks me. It's just the color of the ceramic. If they had taken it down two tones, it made a difference. Uh, T. Taylor saying, an olive green FB Jean releasing new, oh, Chrono Souverain, Dubai edition. Whoa, that has to be looked at. I want to look at that next week, T. Taylor. That, a chrono Seren, that is going to be incredible. Speaking of Dubai edition, there is an amazing salmon dial watch that we'll be featuring next week in the, the live video. Uh, I wouldn't make that your cover photo. You can ask others why that might be a mistake. <laughs> uh, 
have I missed something? Tell me in the chat because I, I'm not I'm not that in tune. If it has to do with travel clocks, I might understand. But thank you for this we watch guy. Next we have a gem from a gent, our man Clint or Clinton. He is a South African expat like yours truly, now living in Adelaide in Australia. Now he has sent in a polar explorer before. I think he has sent an explorer one in before or a submariner. I can't remember. But he has brought out the guns this time. This is one of the best executed engineers I have ever seen, ever seen. Russell, great having you here on the show. It's great to connect with you as well and uh, look forward to sharing your pieces at the very end because they are amazing. They are lungers, ladies and gents. We're going to see some great lungers at the end. So this is an IWC engineer. Reference, hold on to your hats, IW3239-04. This was actually the uh, the cover... Would I say the cover photo? No, it was the um, the main like title video card that was featured before this. And yeah, just as a, a combination of parts, one element that I just love, that. That is what makes the difference. Old school logo, lightning bolt running through it. The engineer, the watch designed for engineers. <laughs> how, how basic was that for an explanation? 70s inspirations again. We've seen the APs and other pieces integrated bracelet and case but look at the way the white works with the stainless steel look at how the hands work next to the applied batons i mean it's so well thought through every single part you can see why he's picked up this watch and uh the, the crown guards as well do they work on this piece should they be there technically this is a rough and ready sports piece but i think this is my one of my favorite i would go so far to say this is the best engineer i've ever seen and as far as you know, representing the watch in this photo, Clint nails it. I think it looks sublime. In G, as Toki says, it's a beast. Uh, and Forbin says an engineer must be newer than the Archie one. So yeah, it sure is. I think this one is uh, a more modern recreation. Maybe I just like the small aspects, like the uh, the you see how they've engraved the inner inner region of the dial. It would be great to see Schaffhausen printed in uh, or Schaffenhausen, as we like to say. Uh, Printed in, in gorgeous cursive script. I think that would also like, seal the deal a bit more. But as a watch that looks to be, it sits right in that ballpark with the Nautilus and the Royal Oaks. It has such a great uh, contemporary style to it. It looks old, looks new. You can't actually place it in a time period. And that's what makes it work. Great piece. Thank you so much for this, Clint. You always send in awesome stuff. And I hope you're doing well, but. Moving next to Clive, Clive Watch Wrangler. Where are you, Clive? He sent this in uh, a couple of weeks back saying, screw it, I'm sending it. <laughs> and we've debated this watch long and hard. I mean, we had a whole live stream dedicated to it, basically, the Black Bay effect. So I'm definitely not going to talk about it uh, anymore. Blaine asking me, what are my thoughts on the dial size and date window size? Let's have a look again. I think it looks terrific. It, the proportions look terrific. They've done such a good job here. Just looking at the way the bezel has been done. You notice how it's polished a little bit and then brushed. I don't really understand the way they have applied the holes, but that's the that's the styling. I think that's how you can actually take the bezel off. Um, but the way the dial has been done, you know, when you're dealing with a white dial, you're dealing with something with a lot of presence, generally, visual presence. So to limit that visual presence, what you to reduce the overall size of it as it is on the wrist, uh, you, what you can do is improve by adding elements like lines in all over the place. So you notice how they have cut up the dial in places. If they hadn't segmented the dial, it wouldn't look as intact as it does here. I mean, I'm just looking at it again. This hollowed out section here for the batons. See how it corresponds with the, the mid links on the bracelet. It's just such a, it really feels like an engineer's watch. And that's exactly what it should be. Uh, the the way they've done it here is masterful. I'll even go so far to say that really well thought through and done. I'm not just saying that because uh, you know giving it clout. I really do think it is a very impressive looking piece. Yeah, stunning, so nice. And the date window also very well integrated. Going so far to actually giving give the watch a uh, applied baton as well is always appreciated because then you see the whole dial light up and it just improves the experience. Nice and clean, clear, simple. What else do I need to say? Black Bear 58, don't think we need to hold on this long enough, but Clive loves this piece. At least he does at the moment. I don't know for how long. 
I have this this funny feeling that this watch is going to be bought and sold like uh what what's a good example <clears throat> like air jordans kind of like the air jordans of the watch space <laughs> so uh hitting the water coming back to you all dark blue looks good in electric light they're, they're definitely addressed i mean again the black bay effect i'll link that video in the corner of the screen for you all to laugh at and look at it was nothing serious but it was me just taking the mickey out of the piece a bit and just uh trying to look at Tudor as a brand and what they're trying to do, considering the year and, and what's been going on, and a business move, not so much a creative move, but uh, yeah, so it goes. The color they definitely nailed, no question. Uh, Forbin saying the little decorative lines near the engineer suggests a Milgauss like bolt electricity. And I mean, that's it, Forbin. The, the whole idea, the engineer being this anti magnetic piece, it's just so elegant the way they did, the way they approached the watch. Moving on next to our man Curtis. Curtis is normally in the chat. He is a legendary pilot. He travels all over the world and he has a great selection of pieces. We featured all sorts from Rolex Sky Dwellers to GMTs of his. And he's currently rocking a Glycine Combat Sub Reference <clears throat> GL0087 with a new old stock NDC strap. And he also loves the paracord and all those details. This was him having Japanese for dinner one night and this as well. I love this. I mean, talking about matching clothes, matching everything else. I don't know if he's in the chat, but uh, it's it's great seeing this piece. There are a few glycines. I think we have some more as the show goes through. But as far as what the brand has done, really improved on their... It's actually amazing. We have a few Yima Supermans later on, and the aesthetics look virtually identical. Maybe that's just... Uh, luck i don't know the industry there was lots of, of chopping and changing between parts and everything back in the day there's something fishy here joe says <laughs> oh dear i wish i could have like a sound effect looper and then have a bum a, a bum a drum track as the as the feature yeah great really nice looking piece a bum track what am i saying yeah i'm actually running out of oxygen in this room i think i need more alcohol this guy's watching prey says let's let's do it Wine and coffee <clears throat> as a combination sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Right, Army Ranger man, he was in the Marines, or well, he, he is a Marine, so uh, you can say you could say he enjoys the function behind things. He's also an industrial designer. He qualified as an industrial designer, but took up being a pilot. So it's it's pretty amazing where we all go at the end of the day and what we decide to do with our careers. And he has a keen eye for detail with regards to pieces, and he. Uh, he loves aesthetics. <laughs> Drink a lot of Merlot. Thanks, B Dev. Thank you for these, Curtis. Next up, we're moving to Dan. And it's a watch that we're going to have a look at that we haven't seen on, I don't think we featured on the show before. And it's got to be one of the quirkiest and coolest pieces that AP makes. <clears throat> and it's one of my favorites in their line, actually, because it was almost AP's attempt to transition themselves, do they call this the offshore diver? I think they do. You know, between the offshore and the Royal Oak, try and like aquanortize the piece, Cassio Oak. So this is a AP diver, offshore diver, I'm pretty sure. The bumblebee, as Eric says, I don't know if this strap is what comes standard. If I'm not wrong, the, the Navy dials generally have Navy straps with it. Maybe I'm wrong, but you can just see the clear contrast between the rubber strap, the way the bezel works inside with the hand, I love it. I think they've approached this so well because we know that 70s inspired pieces always tended to emphasize the color on their minute hands. And doing how they've done it here, they've definitely paid tribute to that 70s diver with this color layout. It's easy to read. I guess the only aspect that's not as usable as a, just a standard running bezel, you know, turning it on the outside, is that you have to use this compressor crown to set the bezel itself. I don't know if it's screwed on. I might be wrong, but I think it probably is. 300 meters of water resistance, I would imagine it is definitely a screw down bezel. Screw down, screw down crown. Uh, internal bezel is neat. It is very nice. And what it does is, again, bring down the overall visual impact or the overall size of the watch. I think it's 42 mils. It brings down the size of the piece because there's more detail added to the inside but you still get to enjoy what makes the Royal Oak, the Royal Oak, the uh, Hublot style bezel layout. 
Yeah, it's a nice piece. It really is. When you talk about a summer watch, it doesn't get much cooler than this as an everyday wearer. And Curtis is in. That's that's great. Thank you for joining us. You're still here in Los Angeles. Uh, Japanese breakfast. Here I'm thinking it's dinner. Sorry. I'm not that good with sushi. I love sushi, but I'm definitely definitely not a connoisseur. <laughs> Total recall. Uh, okay, going to carry on. And, and Megan says, very nice AP. Have a few combinations. Love this version. I do love the I do love the yellow accents. The yellow with the navy works so well together. Again, that color scheme evoking the 70s uh, dive inspirations. Right, moving on to the next from Dear Artifacts Father. What do we call the submission? Do we call it Father Artifact or or Dear Father? I don't know. But uh, he sends in his dad's Seamaster 300M ceramic. And as most of us might know, when Dear Artifact sends in photos, he sends in super, super HD shots. I mean, we could literally look at the cells on his skin if we wanted to, if we pulled in close enough. But uh, yeah, as a combination on a, this is not a um, Spectre variant. This is just your standard 300M, but he's rocking, and it looks like an Omega NATO strap. Uh, the weave looks pretty ideal. Let's see if there's another shot. He sent in two. I'm just wondering what's the best way to have a look at it. This is pretty good. And yeah, I just appreciate it. You know, this this piece taking inspiration from my little Seamaster at the top, the beginning of the show. And as a combination, it's great. Oof, I've just missed something. Hold on a sec. I've got to do a public service announcement uh, 85 minutes in. For those of you who have just joined, uh, what happens, what I've realized is that because of what's been going on with uh, YouTube, they're definitely short on staff. These live shows won't fully process until 24 hours after it's run. So that means that if you have just joined in the last whenever uh, and watching this and watching this show in the future, you might have to wait a full 24 hours before the show fully encodes. So you've probably missed the first hour of the show at this point in time. And I'll mention this again in the next hour for, for all of you joining again. Uh, this is just a little bit of, you know, a bit of detail to add to anyone who might be late to catching up. It's the weirdest thing when you're having to deal with algorithms on top of everything else. It's the way it is. Uh, but yeah, talking about the Father Seamaster, there's some great things that they did with this piece that I want to talk about for a sec. Uh, let me just catch up. Curtis saying, retired Marine, trained industrial designer, been retired airline pilot for 20 days. Curtis, I did not know that you've retired. That is incredible. Hope they gave you a huge package. That's a great way to end off your career. Hey, what an experience. Now I need to get back to designing. Come up with some great ideas. They don't need to be groundbreaking. They just need to be different. That's the secret. So the aspects that I really like about what they've done here with this piece, they, they really do take the inspiration from the 57, but they've done some great stuff with, as we can see, we can zoom right in, sandwich dial. You notice that the, uh, the batons are not printed on top of the dial. It looks great. It's also a nice amount of texture. It's almost like a sand blasted texture to the way the dial's been done. And the second hand is white, which is something that only really reared its head by the time we reached like what generation, the CK2913-7. I think there were like nine variations. By the time we reached the seven, I think we started seeing the lollipop hand in a bit more and the white accent also played a part. The history of the 57 Seamaster is fascinating. Would highly recommend you have a look. And and Dan gave me a, a good question there that I'm going to look at now. As we transition away, dear artifacts, this is an amazing watch. As most of us probably know, you can never go wrong with a master coaxial. Jumping to Demetrius again, who sent in the cover photo for the show, the Omega Speedmaster on a white uh, racing strap. But there were some great comments that I just need to get to in a second. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, uh, Flip and Zipper, thank you. Thank you so much for the super chat again. I hope you're enjoying it. I hope everyone who is part of the show is enjoying the, the chat. I've calmed down a bit since the beginning. If you missed the first hour, I my voice, I lost my voice, needed to go and get water, so I had to mute the show for a while. Dan occasionally likes things. This is a great question. Maybe you could design a new Hodinkee travel clock. Oof. It's not so much the design that's the problem, though. It's, oof. It's, I, I want to actually talk about it more with my special guest next week. But it's the movement. Have you seen what's going on with the movement there and, and how much effort they've put into the movement? Oof, there's going to be a lot of debate going on in the, uh, in the community. 
And it's, it's now a meme at this point in time. I'm pretty sure every single video is basically going to say, you know, there's going to be a comment saying, yes, but what about the travel clock? Is it better than a travel clock? <laughs> so no more travel clocks as, as Bjorn Nahr, oh, botched your name. It's pretty funny. So uh, catching up with all of you in the chat, Dear Artifact says, thanks. <clears throat> Moving to the mesh on the Monaco, and it looks so good. That's as, as Dan just says, it looks stunning. It really looks great. And Demetrius really likes to pair watches with straps, clearly. He has a good eye for detail. We featured Seamasters of his before, and seeing the Monaco, again, this is being the caliber 11 with the crown on the other side, you get to really enjoy the sparsity. And this is just so period correct. Talking about late 60s and 70s, this was all the rave or the rage, whatever you want to say. It just works. I mean, seeing imagine seeing this on Steve McQueen's wrist. I think it would have an even greater impression on the community. Looks sublime. Looks stunning. I can't believe how long I've spent on these pieces. And we've already been running for 90 minutes. What's that? An hour and a half. Okay. I think we can do it. I think we can do it, ladies and gents. Uh, a clue required as to the guest next week. I mentioned earlier that he had an interview with Magnus Walker on Instagram, uh, a really great interview. And uh, yeah, he's a nice guy. We get on well. We've met face to face. We've hung out in London before. And a trip to Los Angeles will be my next step when the world opens up because he has an amazing studio and uh, hanging out will be just great. So I don't want to give it away too, but I'm sure most of you probably, probably have guessed in the chat. Such a nice looking Monaco and that combination. I mean, look at the dial. There's so many quirks about this piece that polarizes the audience. Jean-Claude Beaver. <laughs> be nice to have jean -Claude. I mean, we could have a great chat. I'd love to be told that it's untouched. I think it's very important to know that things have been untouched. Uh, but this is such a quirky watch. The TV case styling, the, uh, the blue, the red accents. But it works so well, even though it is... I love the elements like the way they've introduced the circle aesthetic inside of the square. And they just sort of said, okay, what the hell? Let's just put batons in there sideways to fill up the space. There was no rhyme or reason to this watch. Let's be real. They were racing against uh, Zenith and their El Primero back in the day. So uh, it's, it's pretty funny seeing what they ended up producing and how it's become a cult classic and just such a, a quirky watch that epitomizes that transitional design of the television case of the late 60s, early 70s. Megan's saying, Magnus Walker has my dream garage of cars in LA. He sure does. A rags to riches story, moving from London to Los Angeles and building custom 911s. I mean, can it get any better? Okay, moving on. Eric Bell saying a three hour 45 show. It definitely won't be. Uh, that's not the plan. We never know, depending on how the chat goes and, and everything. Moving on to the next piece. Thank you for this, Demetrius. Moving to Dylan, and I love this. This is a great listing. Oops. Hold on a sec. This is an Air King, Rolex Air King, and it's sitting on a King Air 350. <laughs> I think that's great. Talking about pairing watches and planes, we know that the Air King was a watch that was actually given to RAF pilots in the late 40s, early 50s. That's where it got its its heritage. Um, is my special guest? No, it's definitely not, Dan. That would be fun too. That would, really would be fun. Sad that he's disappeared though. Still got the YouTube channel up, but we haven't heard a word from the guy. So uh, anyway, moving to the Air King on the, the King Air 350, clever man. I mean, Dylan nailed it. And talking about this watch, the, the Air King as this, the most, one of the most peculiar pieces that Rolex has made, I have a feeling that this watch is going to be collectible in years to come. Uh, just because it is the king of quirkiness, does it even have, is it using T-Rex hands? I don't know. You might need to clarify. But we know the story. We've spoken about it often. I do really like the play on words, though. Uh, very seldom that you see that kind of pairing as an arrangement. Um, so Dan's saying, did you ever see Air King with two nines on it? Yeah, I did from a Watch Finder video. And what I loved about that video, so this is when I, I have, don't watch Watch Finder videos much anymore. Uh, as far as watch content goes, I'm a little bit sparse because if I'm not making the content, I'm editing the content. So it goes, it's very difficult to catch up on what everyone's doing, but that video was so good because it had you fooled. You could sit and look at that watch. It just, you know, he's holding it there and talks about it for 20 minutes or however long it was, I can't remember. And then suddenly says, as you can probably tell, there are two nines on the watch. And it's just like, what? <laughs> All of a sudden it wakes you up. Um, yeah, and Hans saying, did you ever watch a show in the UK called Spitting Image? 
No, I haven't. I've only been in the UK for, what's it now? This is my sixth year in the UK. So I'm definitely not in tune with the culture fully yet. <laughs> but uh, yeah, as far as pieces go, the one element that I, I love to criticize and most of us will point out, funny, we're going to see an Oyster Perpetual later on that addresses this perfectly. The 55-5 issue, as mentioned by... Oh, Neferion says, I actually like the 55-5 issue. We talk about the quirks. This should have a zero here to balance out because every single uh, numeral you see around the dial has two digits attached to it. So funny, crazy quirks. And there is an awesome OP that we're going to see later on that uh, addresses it so well. It's actually an amazing looking piece. Uh, I will go on record. I hate this watch. Thank you for that, Hans. <laughs> And Dan's saying, is the Air King the same case as the 39 Explorer? I don't think it is, no. It uses the same case as the Milgauss, and I think that means it's a 40 millimeter case. The thickness is a little bit different. It's a quirky piece all the way in many different areas. Anyway, I've got to move on. Dylan, thank you for sending this in. What did Edmund send us? A Jean Marcel day date. I have no idea about this brand. Someone might need to clarify the name and the details a bit more. Uh, did I mention? No, no more details. He just gave me the, the name of the piece itself. I do love that dial. Reminds me of, of blinds. Call it like a blind dial. Let's get right into the details and hold on it for a second while I catch up with you in the chat. Triple five soul man. That's awesome. Uh, 1,000 Gauss is pathetic nowadays. Talking about anti, oh, talking about Milgauss, yeah. But surely they're much higher than that. I mean, they're, they're, they're rated at about 15,000 or, or at least 9,000 or something. Surely I decline. It's a great point, though. And again, I miss your chats. Dan is great. He's tagging me in all of the questions he asks and mentions, so it makes it much easier for me to see. Uh, and Mark's saying your live stream is awesome. It's a pleasure, Mark. Uh, it, does, it does definitely bring the community in a bit more. We can engage, have a good chat. Um, but talking about Milgauss, they, the watches have transitioned away from 1,000 Gauss ages ago. That was just when it started. You know, you don't have dive watches rated at 100 meters anymore. Um, they just call it Milgauss because it's quite a sexy name. And uh, it's probably rated to much more, three, four, five, ten 10 times more than it is. 121 click bezel. Great to have you here. And Zane's saying uh, they're talking about cars. And yeah, it's great. So moving on through 15K it is. You see, I, I know my Omega is 15K. I don't know what Rolex is rated at, but that's it. I uh, just missed my shot. Did you really? Sorry about that, 121. So looking at Jean Marcel, I don't know anything about this brand, but I must say the dial has been done so well. You can never go wrong with a day date. This is cool. Have you ever seen Swiss made on the top of the dial and limited edition at the base? That's something quirky. I'm wondering if it would have been better. Is it would have been better if Swiss was at the base and limited at the top? No, no, this is actually better because you, you naturally look at the day. So seeing Swiss made there, very good play. Also notice that the verticality of the lines on the dial pushes your eyes around it a bit more. It's it's almost like segmented. I would really do like the way it plays in the light. You also sent in a shot of the movement. I don't know if this is 18 karat gold. I don't know if it's plated. You need to clarify this watch a little bit more to me uh, if anyone knows in the chat. But there's the movement. It's probably brass, maybe, possibly. And I think there's another shot he sent of the side profile. I do enjoy the way they've done the case, though. Very nice. And this is not, this is definitely not sports casual, but it is, uh, you know, casual. Casual fits the bill. And catching up with you in the chat again. Going to leave this on the screen for a second. And moving, actually, I'm going to move to the next piece. Edmund, thank you for sending this. We're, we're still on E and we haven't even, oh, it's unreal. Eric Bell sends in, let's get this right, an Apex. Now, Eric Bell is a, is a diver who definitely dives with his watches. We can say that much. He has done how many thousand dives in his lifetime? This is an Apex 1,000-meter manual relief valve. Is that the best way to say it? I don't know. Manual release, relief. Can't believe that it's a limited edition BDEV. You know, it's the way marketing works. It's what attracts people. Apex as a brand, never heard of before, but we know that Eric Bell, when it comes to divers, they need to be big and they need to go deep. I need to go. I love that Ben Climber. If anyone's on Instagram and they follow Ho Donkey, uh, there's this one caption where they talk about Ben Climber going deep, and it's just, it, you, <laughs> it cracks me up every time. So, 
talking about this piece, thousand meters helium safe. Uh, it's it's a real depth watch. Would Eric Bell ever travel a thousand meters? I don't know, but just with regards to, uh, <laughs> I mean, why why are dive watches rated this deep, Eric? Can you explain that in the chat, please? Because I I know for a fact that professional divers generally transcend. They they go between one hundred and twenty and 200 meters on average, right? 250, maybe maximum. So why on the Lord's green earth would they make a thousand meters for a dive watch? Be great to know if you'd like to clarify that a bit more, Eric, because you know your dive watch is much more uh, than, than me. <laughs> a thousand meters, and it's, it's not exactly over. I mean, you, you can see Eric is actually, oops, come back. Eric is wearing his dive suit as it is over his gloves. Yeah, that's great. You can see this watch has been worn. He might have faded this bezel in bleach. This to me looks like a a bleach job. This doesn't look natural, but uh, yeah, love it. Love the legibility. You want something that works. Dive watches. It's great. Eric really takes dive diving to the next level. He's probably the most dedicated diver we have on the show. Uh, I'm going to move on though. Eric, thank you for sending this in. I need to transition to the next pieces because as it is, the show is jam-packed. Look at this view and the scene. Flippin' Zippo, who has been in the chat for, for, since the beginning of the show, he sends in a Aragon prototype. And it's a family that has been sent out to a few of the, the punters on the show. Blue shirt, Flippin' Zippo, uh, Thomas Burnett, sent through by Megan and Jacinta, who is uh, founder Timeless Capital's daughters. And uh, just as a combination, I love this. So gone, this looks like fly fishing to me. Is it fly fishing? Please correct me there. I love this shot in the background. I mean, where is this? It looks amazing. Uh, and again, talking about a Coke bezel. Sorry about the flickering there between the images. Uh, Coke bezel, hardcore, heavy duty. I think these are all rated at like they're, they're 48 millimeters in size. They're just these huge overbuilt Canada, Tom. <laughs> thank you. Uh, that's incredible, man. I mean, talking about scenery. Again, I'm new to the Northern Hemisphere, so I don't know. Half the stuff. No, not fly fishing. <laughs> Thanks, B Dev. Uh, you can tell I'm not a fisherman. I think I've been fishing maybe twice in my life. And the second time I almost shot my thumb off with a slingshot, but that's another story. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's great. I really love the setting. I think the composition is what makes it. And how you guys can rock watches this size, I think is amazing. It's incredible. I definitely couldn't. I mean, it would look like a, an anchor on my wrist, but <laughs> that's just me. Uh, thank you for the flip and zipper. It's a great shot. Uh, not only do you get the scenery, you get some engagement and interaction going on. Uh, did I really say fly fishing? What does the reel normally sit at the back with a fly fishing rod? See, I haven't been in the design game for fishing, so I wouldn't know, but uh, that's it is going to carry on through though to the next piece. And this comes in from Henry, and this is one of the biggest heavy hitters for the show. Are you ready, everyone? Oof! wow, this. I really, really, really like this watch. Longer Saxonia, outsized date. This being black on, and it looks to be yellow gold. And I mean, there it is. Talk about sports casual. I think this is more of uh, casual than sports. But talking about the way Lunga addresses their watches, Langi, as Tom says, yeah, they're Langi, Langi and Soon. The, the oversized date is really, it's what's made, I mean, when we think of Glasuta as a, as a brand, as a family of pieces, that whole neck of the woods, they really do love to emphasize big dates. So this being the main primary aspect that you're looking at, I think is great. You're dealing with a watch here that is, I don't think it's a Saxomatic. Maybe someone can clarify that. If Russell's still in the chat, is this a Saxomatic? Can you actually, is it manual wind or is it automatic? But all the little details like the double batons at the quarters, the Everything about this watch is just pure to what Lunga exemplifies. I would imagine it's about 39 millimeters in size. And we've got a gorgeous pusher on the side that lets you adjust the date on the fly, which is must be so much fun to just cycle through Lungomatic. Is it BS? Uh, we'd like to know a bit more detail if anyone knows. But as far as Lunga goes, you know, it's, it's a Saxonia thin with a lot of added detail. Saxonia date. Uh, afraid I'm not sure, Russell says. So I'm going to I'm going to assume it's an automatic because you're dealing with a a full date. Maybe it's a bit more practical that it is automatic, but it is absolutely gorgeous. 
and it really does complete i mean talk about a watch collection and completing your journey if you're someone who loves date complications and the practicality and simplicity look at it stunning uh, there's a mention by rob saying run into a ditch trying to sell trying to tell the time that's the thing oh right <laughs> i get it i get it because you're so distracted by the dial for sure uh should the date be at not be at the five les says we're talking more about glasuto riganol Langer prides themselves on having them at the top and i think it's just so crisp and clear we're going to see an amazing date complication longer later on at the very end of the show actually uh, sent in by russell and you can just see how the style has translated through these pieces and uh, Russell actually expresses this very well. <clears throat> in he, We've been chatting via WhatsApp and catching up. He lives about 40 miles from me, so we've really been having some banter going on. He says that even though, I hope I don't butcher this, that, that Lunga is a part of the Richmond group. Please correct me. Say yes in the chat if I'm right in saying that. Lunga is a part of the Richmond group. It feels so much like a tight-knit family. It's, it's that, uh, the idea that you're being treated as a valued customer in this line when dealing with any watch from any price bracket. And that's what's so important. And I think that might be down to the CEO of the company. His name is Schmidt. I don't know his, his first name, but he's a, uh, yes, I'm all right. Thank you, Russell. Uh, it's just, it's a gorgeous watch. Stunning piece. And you're going to be sitting on this for ages if I don't carry on. So I have to. We've almost been running the show for two hours. And uh, yeah, it's great. Eric's saying real depth watches came out of a quiet, which is now you're talking about dive pieces. Okay. I've got to carry on through. Henry, thank you for sending this in. This is definitely one of the best pieces for the show. Everything about it screams longer to me, and that's what makes it. Um, one more thing I'd like to add. When you think about the Odysseus, would this watch not represent the Odysseus better if it was a sports piece? Think about that for a second. Large date, subdial, quarters, of the, you know, double batons at the quarters, stainless steel, maybe an integrated bracelet, you're done. I think that would give it a bit more of a sporty hook to it. Okay, going to move on through, Henry. It's a gem. Love it. Now, this is something cool to look at. We're jumping to Seiko. I think, have we even looked at Seikos yet? I don't think so. I'm going to get to the Rolex in a second. Don't worry. But these uh, four Seikos, we have, now Jack, he, I think he runs by the username of Dublin Watch on Instagram. He has sent in. And Hans saying, does Eric have the 166? He does. He definitely does have the five-digit sea dweller. And Eric uses it all the time. Um, okay. So these Seikos here. Now, Jack, by the name of Dublin Watch on Instagram, I think, he sent in these two pieces before, Snowflake and what they call the Whirlpool, I think, in the, in the collector space. And these two pieces, a bit more modern. We have a bit of a Prospects-inspired samurai. I'm guessing this is a samurai. And this being just a, it looks like a pure 70s automatic 21 jewel day, day date Seiko 5. It looks great. So as far as Seiko pairings go, I mean, these Grand Seikos, we featured on the show often in the past. But I love this, this, this Yacht Master. We're going to look at it now because he did send in a wrist shot of it. Nice set, though. You can see where the, uh, the tent, this is his full collection, I think, if he told me. Uh, this is all he has, and as far as watches go, nice versatility. You can see that the beta, the pro sport beta, the more casual wear, the everyday watches that you can enjoy, and then the uh, proverbial F off piece, Yacht Master. Now, we don't ever see this piece featured at all, and I have to say, it's just what it does so well is it has that, that hook of being a Rolex, got a solid gold Rolex on your wrist, which is just fun and awesome. And then you're dealing with just everything from blackout indices on the dial. I mean, is this standard? Is this how the watch is actually made or was made? I can imagine they're probably out of, out of order at the moment. But uh, I just really enjoy the combination of parts. And the Yacht Master as this piece that celebrates yachting, <laughs> not, not being the rich guy on the yacht, but it was actually supposed to be a watch that was intended for people who did yacht. I've used the word yacht about five times. What I'm trying to say is referring back to Chichester and his past. The Yacht Master came in to segue itself into that area. Pink with gold. How cool. As we talk, Dan, are we talking about this? Oh, as, as a pairing, yeah, I must say. I mean, this, as, as far as Rolex goes, I think there, there are two ways you can wear Rolex. Either sport elegance, casual, everyday, stainless steel, you know, flies under the radar, 
but then you can also wear Rolex like this, which is just, you know, make a statement. Why not? You're wearing a Rolex, solid gold bezel as well. I mean, everything about it is just, it's really elegant. I love, love the way they've done the indices on this piece, or should I say the, the plot, uh, black accents with gold details, the red Yachtmaster text. Let's get another shot of it here. Never featured it on the show before. So I thought, you know, well worth having some time spent looking at it. I think, and these three together, talking about uh, a trio, oof, oof, really nice taste. And this is what makes these shows so good. Never know what you're going to get. Onyx Stones, Forbin says, that's probably it. You're definitely right there. And uh, yeah, red writing. I mean, the Yachtmaster has so many quirks to it. I do enjoy the platinum bezel insert. I think that's that's a step above. But in saying that, the, the combination of solid gold here just makes it look so so unique and different. So thank you for this, Jack. And then we're jumping to Jeremy next, Doxa Club, jumping in to have a look at a two, sub 200, 130 years. This is a commemorative piece. I'd like to, oh, I'm sure he sent me a, an elaborate email about, about this, which I obviously didn't save because I'm saving so much as the, as the development goes. I can't believe how behind I'm lagging here. Are we doing okay for time? I'd be definitely not. Damn it, I've got to speed up. <laughs> and I'm missing all of you in the chat. So let me just, uh, the docs is well positioned here on the screen, kind of, sort of. And saying hi to all of you again, if I'm missing you in the chats. Again, everyone's just having a good go, chatting about whatever. So what does this watch do so well? It has a beads of rice bracelet. It has liar lugs, ceramic bezel. Uh, the docs are the typical docs are highlights of uh, the, the running seconds. That's what makes these 70s inspired pieces so cool. Three hours, 31 minutes, Eric Bell. I really hope not because, you know, as it is, I, I'm normally hung over for about two days after these shows. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, beautiful. Really is beautiful. Nice combination of parts here. And it's such a versatile watch. Talk about something that you can wear on a daily basis, wearing over the sleeve. Why not? I could imagine he was probably surfing or bodyboarding. Generally, you wear a full sleeve when you're out in the water for a long time. Uh, but it's just such a nice combo. And we don't generally see the, the sub 200. We normally see the, the very typical sub 300 most of the time. Fully loomed bezel. That's a good point, Tom. So all of these plots light up. Can you imagine what it must look like? Great. Really is. And the beads of rice bracelet just makes it sing. Uh, all the parts. Liar lugs. You can never go wrong. Character. And it's, it's elegant. Simple. Refined. Uh, have a look at the way the bezel has been done here with this coin edging running around. It's fun. This could have been a great cover photo for the show as well but I think this was also sent in a bit late. Thank you for this, Jeremy. Next, thoughts, of, thoughts on beads of rice. Dan occasionally likes things. Uh, very briefly, I will say that when we compare, I like to compare it next to the Rolex Jubilee. I think that's quite fair. But then saying that there are other bracelets like the Holzer bracelet, which is probably more true to the Jubilee. But this one is, is kind of in that ballpark. It looks a lot more dated than a Jubilee does, which is funny to say. Uh, but as far as a, as a combination, you can wear this with a lot more watches, I think. The Jubilee tends to work with many more brands, where what did I say Jubilee? the Bees of Rice works better with many more brands. Uh, the Jubilee, not so much. Jubilee is a little bit more polarizing in that area. But as far as comfort goes, I mean, the Bees of Rice probably pips the Jubilee ever so slightly because it's just so much more articulate. I mean, you have a look at all of those uh, articulating elements, you just know. It's, it's a strange, I definitely want to talk about bracelets more in a future video. It's a nice idea, actually. Okay, Doxa looks fantastic. Also, enjoy the fact, I didn't even mention, he matches his sleeve with the, the watch's color itself. And, yeah, it just works, you know, for a surfer. I mean, this is a perfect watch for the ocean. Everyday wear, just chuck it about, use it. It won't fail you. Okay, I'm going to carry on. Thank you for this, Jeremy. Going to Jimmy next, and he sends in a few shots, a 214270. I think we've had a few of these already on the show, but we don't see the loom. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I am uh, contemplating a Rolex purchase. Maybe next year, <laughs> if all things go well. <laughs> I don't know how I'd ever save for one, but most of you might know I love batons and I love numerals, and I'm really considering a 214270 as a piece. So interested in hearing your thoughts. Uh, this have some community engagement here. What do you reckon? Say, say why for yes, that I should pick up an Explorer 39. Say no for, for no. <laughs> and the reason why I like, I'm starting to really grow, or this watch is starting to grow on me, 
because when I compare it next to the Seamaster that I have, I think this shows Ro Rolex's transitional approach to how they've done contemporary pieces. And the Omega is just a classic, inspired by a classic. There's just, there's lots of yeses, holy smokes. Well, that's good to know. At least the, the audience seems keen. <laughs> And, and, and saying, Patek, don't worry, and we'll get to Patek and Lunga in the next you know, 10, 20 years of my life, for sure. Uh, I want to take the Rolex and the Omega box together. And there's something about having, you know, I'm someone who definitely is interested in a watch that's versatile. And I think the Explorer, for me, with all the modern things like uh, the better clasp, the, the chromolite loom, the presence is nice. I could rock 39 very easily because it's virtually the same size as the Omega that I'm wearing, um, you know. 36 is cool. The 36 is a nice watch, but I'm I'm getting to a point now where I kind of like presence that rides the line. Uh, would probably be better for me, Tom says, two-piece meal deal, as Mr. Perpetual says. So I don't know. It's it's an open-ended discussion. If anyone has a 214-270 that would like to send it in for a review, a discussion, I would love to feature it. Uh, you can email me. It's in the description of this video. I'm based on the south coast of England. So if you're based in the UK, do it. It'll be in good hands. And I would love to talk about the watch in more detail and how I see this as this such a peculiar transitional modern piece, but they've done it in a good way. Uh, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> the chats are going ballistic here. That's, that's great. Bouchard saying it's a fantastic all around watch. Can't recommend it enough because many people seem to love it in the community. And that's just it. I mean, I don't want to sit on this for too long. Let's move across to the next piece. Uh, Jimmy also sends in a beautiful Pepsi. This looks like he's sitting in a plane right now. Definitely looks like he's sitting in a plane. And this is the go-to watch of 2020, 2019. Mentioning there's so many. Zenit 884, I know you like it. Demetrius Fusher, <laughs> go fund me for the Rolex. Holy smokes. Megan, that would be such a good idea. West or East Sussex, Hans says, I'm in West Sussex. I am, how far? How far away from Brighton? I'm like 10 or 20 miles outside of Brighton. Um, that as far as a GoFundMe page would be amazing, but really, I mean, that's that's really taking it far. Uh, I, I really like the idea of having the Rolex Omega boxes ticked as everyday, easy, flying under the radar pieces that you can just rock and roll, not thinking about this is what this is the experience that I'm getting out of the Omega that I wear. I don't think about it at all. Put it on, and I can wear it all week. Forget about it. Same with the with the Rolex. Being able to uh, during the course of the week are be able to go from one to the other is ideal for me. Versatility with watches is the running theme that I love. And, and saying Smiths wants their watch back. <laughs> well, I'm definitely going to keep the Everest. I mean, that, that watch is here to stay. I love it. And comparing that to the Rolex would be a fun exercise too, no? Mention of Goldfinger from Turkey Vulture. And we're talking then about the 6542, the original Pepsi, the Pussy Galore. This being the modern incarnation with the Jubilee bracelet. Uh, definitely addresses a lot of elements that people wanted to see. But as far as the hype and demand goes, you cannot believe the prices these things are selling for. So it's just ridiculous when we think of it that way. Uh, stunning looking piece. And that's it. Uh, Main is saying, what do you think about the OP with the blue, the blue 369 dial reference? That's one thing that I, I'm finding that I don't like about everyday wearing watches is color. I'm not someone who likes color on my watch. I don't know what it is, but I need it to be monotone. I need it to be either black or white. <clears throat> OP39 might be a great example. Uh, it's perpetual. Just, there are other OPs in the line as well, but that's the way it is. Uh, yeah, I've got to, I'll be talking about this for the next hour at this rate. Thank you for sending this, Jimmy. Next up, we have another piece. I think this is the same Jimmy. What a great, if this is his three-piece collection, he's done a good job. And what is this beer? Oof. Don't know, German beer. If anyone knows the brand, let me know. But uh, as far as pieces go, 214270, 216570, 216750. Oof, I botched that reference. And the, the 16570. Yeah, yeah, getting a, getting a bit lisdexic looking at these numerals. Explorer 2, classic, basic. The Archie Luxury Watch, we can say uh, it's Belgian. Thank you, Moose Man. <laughs> You see what I mean? I'm new to the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, Demetrius says Explorer is better than Everest, but the Everest is more beautiful. Numerals. And Demetrius, definitely a good point. I, will, I want to get it. You see, if, if there is a 214-270 that someone wants to send that's floating around, 
three piece hunger buster. Yeah, Mr. Perpetual, you're right. Uh, I want to talk about that in more detail and how it's funny how the watch has grown on me over the last, I would say, month. I've been looking at it more and more. And I feel like the way it's it's been approached is very true to Rolex's modern identity. And I think that's what makes it fun, especially next to a, a vintage classic inspired variant. Polo looks good. And again, I'm not someone, I'm, I'm peculiar, guys. I, I enjoy watches with no dates, no complications if possible. Just the time, just the time and maybe a bezel, that's me. Maybe a chronograph at a push, but at this point, I want bare bones, stock standard. And it just, it works for me. Can't say anything more than that. It's, I'm very, uh, should we say conservative <laughs> in that zone. And there's all sorts of comments going on here. But really, uh, Jimmy, if you're in the chat, I don't know if you are, but stunning set of three pieces. They really do look great. And this being the solid end link, so I'd imagine the later, this being Swiss made, no tritium. So this being an early 2000s variant, uh, can't go wrong with a polar dial. And it works so well with fairer skins, the presence and, and all of that. Nico's saying, I need a date. Yeah, uh, I've made a video. I've put that video in the corner of the screen. Why not, if, if I remember? Uh, why, what did I say? Five reasons why you should enjoy no date watches. And it's mainly to do with uh, uh, not thinking ahead. Whenever you see the date, you think ahead in life, at least for me. Being someone who does consulting a lot of the time, you're thinking about deadlines and you look at the watch and you see that you've got four, you know, four or five days before the deadline. It kind of catches you in your tracks. It takes you away from the beauty of just simple time, time being a precious commodity. Jimmy, thank you for this. Moving across to Joe. Joe was one of the last gents who sent in watches for the show. This being a Panerai reference, 1392, 42 mil. Another Luminor, nice to see that featured on the show. Hitting the water again. Turkey Vulture saying national treasure. <laughs> Talking about, uh, that's great. It's called a Cyclops, Moose Man. Yeah, I hear. Um, how much was the Lumen Zeit work? Zane, it's called a Phantom, if I'm not wrong. I'm sure you're directing it to Russell, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's called the Zeit work Phantom. We might be seeing that later on in the show, I don't know. Just be ready. I can tell you the end of the show, you're going to see some amazing pieces. Zane and Russell brought the big guns today. And, uh, and Megan did as well. You will see in a second. Uh, and Marco's saying, this group has some real watch smarts. Thank you. That was a pleasure. Marco, this is the whole idea. We all get to connect. We get to chat. And hopefully you guys can make connections with each other through this. That's, that's all a part of the fun. I mean, I love this. The show, the show is great as it is, the way we can engage. But then being able to actually chat to you after the hours through emails or Actually, emails are the worst, <laughs> but I try my best. I'm pretty bad with replying to emails. So a 42 millimeter Luminor, great size. Again, contemporary. It's something that will probably last the test of time instead of being this oversized piece. It's much more practical as an everyday wearer. You can see he's wearing this uh, rubber camo style. It looks like an urban camo strap on it. And yeah, as a combination, Luminor, it's the way it is. But the next photo that he sends in, I like the digital clam. It definitely lines up with what Panerai is about, which is this outdoor, you know, hardcore urban talking about uh, Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger and all the guys. So moving next to Joe's next piece. Now, this photo was amazing. And I, I love it. The presentation of this shot. I mean, if it wasn't wrist shot week and I could just put any old photo as the cover, this would probably take it. I mean... Talking about presentation, Seamaster Professional 300, just your, your bog standard ceramic that's just come out recently. I love the way the shot was taken and the lighting, the presentation on the table. This looks like a cast iron table that it's sitting on and you get to enjoy all the details, strap, bezel, dial, and it's really high res as well. We get to have a look at all the aspects. So let me just leave it on here. The next pieces that are coming up, you're really going to enjoy. Wait for this. This is going to be a premiere. 42 mil, truth fears. Yeah, and that is the one thing that many people aren't chuffed about. And I made a video about this too. <laughs> Jeez, like, how many links can I put into a video? Uh, and Megan's saying not a fan of the bracelets. It's polarizing. This whole watch is polarizing. I was tossing up the thoughts between this and, and the one that I picked up in the end, and I needed more neutrality. Uh, this, this watch is busy in many places, but if you're someone who loves Pierce Brosnan and James Bond and that background and what this watch did for the brand, actually, at that time period. 
uh, and Shane's saying photo taken yesterday. Uh, this is awesome. But talk, uh, Shane, this is you. Please tell me that I'm mentioning Joe, but maybe I've got the wrong person here. I don't know. <laughs> anyway, I love the shot. I think it's great. And talking about the size, Omega would really do themselves justice if they brought it down to 39 mils. This piece would be such a win, and it would fit so many more wrists out there. Okay, now moving to Jonathan next. Now, I have a feeling that Jonathan is in the film industry, maybe. This is my guess, at least. Uh, it has a massive pimple on the side. I've heard, Megan, it really does. They call it the warts, the Reese's Cup, and uh, <laughs> yeah, the helium valve is that aesthetic. You know, what I, may, what I say in the video when discussing it, I made a video about James Bond watches and said that this looks like a gadget. This looks like a watch that James Bond would wear, and that's why it's sold so well, uh, because it was used as a gadget in every film. And uh, yeah, so I mean, the, the, the helium release valve, though peculiar, is now ingrained in the DNA of the watch. But since, since then, Omega has taken them off their planet oceans and some of the pieces, and it's funny. Uh, they seem to be doing all sorts of creative and peculiar things. Right, going to move through to Jonathan next. Now, we're looking at Bremont, right? We all love Bremont as a brand. This being a very particular Bremont. Bremont linked to Kingsman. <clears throat> Jeez, how high did my voice go there? The Kingsman, what was it called? Kingsman Special pr special Service. What do they call it? That whole film franchise that came out with, uh, oof, oof, I'm going to botch the names now. <laughs> Bremont. <laughs> Oh, what, what is his name, man? Damn it. I come so bad with names, I tell you, half the time. What's the, he, play, he was uh, in the King's Speech. He's been in so many films, and I should know. I mean, I was going to write a, a, a British ancestry like exam at one stage, and I had to know his name. It's pronounced Brumont. Okay, fine. I'll call it Brumont from now on. Kingsman's Secret Service. Okay, so the film, the original film with Edgerton, I think that was the one actor, and Colin Firth. Thank you, Giza. This was a watch that was featured for that film, I think. Or this was maybe the second. This was maybe the second edition. He sent in two, PVD and also white. Lovely setting. This is where you live. This kind of looks like Earl's Court, but I might be wrong here. I've got a friend who's staying in Earl's Court. So so both of these pieces, this this might be the, this is also the variant. I don't know. But it's it's essentially a world time uh, as well as a chronograph. It's a world time chronograph with a date complication. It's a great looking Brumont, right? Don't worry. Uh, it's going to get better in a second. <laughs> First, <laughs> Orange Hand, that's going to be one of the best <laughs> best comments of the show so far. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, I love you guys. You guys make this so much more enjoyable, I must say. Uh, Freddie Turmer is pronounced charlatan. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing. So, Brumont, as a brand, we know it's had a lot of ups and downs, and I uh, won't go into it too much, but this watch being featured and linked to the film. Wonderful. Great. Now, as many of us might know or might not know, there's a new film coming out soon called King's Man, supposedly the origins of the Kingsman uh, franchise. And it's set in like the First World War. It looks like complete and utter like rubbish, it's just an action flick. There's no like depth to it at all. But I mean, you know, you go to these films for fun. Anyway, there is a partnership. This is where it gets fun and interesting. Listen to this. There is a partnership between the film King's Man and a watch company. And what watch company do you think it is? Any guesses? I actually want to see it in the chat. Uh, anyone want to? Oh, yes. Uh, Tom Austin got it. Nailed it. So this is the dummy watch for the film. And holy smokes, does it look good. JLC Kingsman. What does that look like to you? I mean, that is just class personified. It is elegant. Pure elegance. And I love the fact that it's the JLC has been, been able to creep their way in and, uh, should I say, creep their way in. They found their way in to be associated to this franchise of, of elegance, of, uh, you know, clothing and taste and satire, you know, sartorial, I'm saying satire. It's an amazing looking watch. And the original, if I'm not wrong, this is what the original, this is what the watch is based on. Old school JLC. Uh, you have these very deco lugs. This reminds me of a very specific Patek from from the time period. Uh, what what is? I'm sure Zane or, or Russell might know. Um, reference three something something something. Look, 
looking at the case size, I just have a feeling these lugs, the way they've been done, very rare Pateks of the time had these cases assigned to them. But I just love how they've taken this piece as the inspiration and this being a dummy, again, this is a dummy hero watch used in the film. I think it really does look great. Absolutely beautiful. Talk about elegance and sophistication. I would totally splurge on this watch. I would buy one. If I could, I would. To me, talk about rose gold, blued hands, leather strap. And there's also another shot of it with, oh, this is the original watch again, with a cane, this being the Kingsman cane. So I have a feeling that Jonathan is in the film industry. He must have worked on the film itself because uh, I feel like it's very difficult to get your hands on pieces like these, being you know the originals and, and all the rest. Uh, not exactly Oscar, not exactly Oscar worthy movies, as Tom says. But I don't think that's that's not the point, though. I think Tom, great, great mention, though. Patek uh, three four eight eight. I think that's that's it, Zane. As Russell says, three x x x. You know those those references we had. They, they had some amazing uh, lug designs. Uh, what's this? Uh, John Goldberger has a video about the watch. I think. He has a very rare one, like a one-off, and they have almost identical case styling to them. Anyway, getting off topic. It's not so much, are we actually good for time, people? I think we are. It's not so much about highbrow, lowbrow. It's it's the affiliation of, <clears throat> when you think Kingsman, you think Savile Row, you think uh, brogues, Oxford's brogues, shoes, signet rings, canes. Uh, whether you're talking, he did send me photos of, of guns and everything on the table, on a desk, but I thought rather not include Walter PPKs and stuff on the show in case YouTube does something stupid and blocks it, who knows. But uh, as far as a watch that represents not only the, you know, the early 1900s, doesn't exactly fall in line with the 1900s. This looks a little bit too modern for that timeline, but it is a, looks like a pocket watch inspired piece for sure. Uh, new fans to JLC, and that's all that matters, Tom Orson. You get someone, I mean, just think about it, uh, a budding, someone who's interested in watches, who's only ever owned, you know, Casios and stuff, they suddenly see JLC, and then they jump on YouTube and they see Reverso, and there's another Reverso sold, and so it is. Uh, I like it. This watch, to me, is one of the most stunning looking pieces of the show. But we're not done yet. There's going to be a lot more. So hold on to your hats. Jonathan, thank you for sending this in. Please send me an email and let me know whether or not uh, you are a part of the filmmaking process. I feel like you work on the sets. Maybe you're in the prop department. Maybe I'm right. Don't know. I'm going to take a wild guess. Great. Thank you for this. Next to Juan. Our man Juan sends in the most peculiar and interesting vintage pieces. And he sent us a few. I've, I've shortened the, the submissions from him this week. I think he sent three or four more that I didn't save. They'll be carried over to the next show. Uh, and Triforce Rich, who's stepping out. It's a pleasure having you here. For all of you who have joined, there's, there's many more of you who have joined that I haven't said hi to. Welcome to everyone. Orange Hand made a mention that I think I missed. Again, if my, uh, if my name isn't tagged, I can't see it very well. The Elvis watch, as mentioned, yes, this is called a Hamilton Altair. And look at the way that the case has been done. You know, very 50s inspired. And he loves these, these deco inspired pieces. And he sent in a few more, I think. Let's move to the next. <clears throat> a 1973 Timex. I love this. Old school mechanical. Does he mention the movement or anything? No. But uh, he really loves the quirkiness of pieces. Don't worry. He also collects. <laughs> I can't imagine the size of his watch box. But he has everything from pocket watches from the 1800s to... Vacherons, he has Pate Calatravas, he has Breguets, and all the rest. I think it's, it says something about a watch enthusiast and collector when you can do all of that, but also enjoy the little things like a simple Breguet numeral layout Timex, manual wind, simple, basic, to the T. I must say the champagne dial is pretty cool. And he swapped out the strap. I don't know, this, this is definitely not a remake. This is an original from 73, it looks great. And uh, Curtis saying, talking about the, the Explorer, what did he say? Perfect three watch, Seamaster Explorer one, and you hit 100,000 JLC Reverso with enamel. Ooh. Ooh. Curtis, you're tempting me. Yeah, I don't know what to do. I'm in such a bad headspace. You know, doing, doing what I do, I get to see so many nice pieces, and I'm, as many of you might know, I'm a stickler for the simple stuff. So, love it. I would love that pairing. Nice looking piece though, right? I mean, Timex, how much did this watch cost? A hundred bucks, but Breguet numerals, just perfect of that time, the seventies. 
Moving across, we also have a Hesalite Speedmaster, very true to form for what the show has been about so far. Talking about casual sports pieces, and we're not done yet. Don't worry, we're going to get to some serious heavy hitters as we go through now. Uh, it's going to get better and better, actually, as the show goes. These last, luckily, we have, I would say, about 25 more pieces. As you see here, this is the selection that's left. But uh, Speedmaster, professional, plain and simple, Hesalite. Great go-to watch as a first piece. I could link a video in the corner about the how many 15 best, what did I say 20? The 20 best modern Omegas that you can buy. <laughs> Omega. Yeah, that's the original. Yeah, it's nice. Oh, and Juan's in the chat. It's great to have you here, sir. And I think you sent something else. No, you didn't. This was all I saved from you. Sorry. You did send in some Seikos, but I didn't save them for the show. Uh, we've featured you a lot on this. We've had 15 submissions for you on the show at once, but uh yeah, as it is, Juan, thank you as always for sending these in. And it's always a pleasure seeing what you bring out of the watch box. But next up, we saw a Batgirl in the Batman at the beginning of the show, and now we get to see a Batgirl. And I am checking, so this is from JW. And I think he just picked this watch up. He was lucky enough to pick this up recently. And see what I mean when I say I like the watch on the Jubilee? <laughs> There's just some kind of underscore. Yeah, I mean, talking about this watch, we speak about it a lot. And my biggest detail that I like to mention is I think as far as the GMT goes, there's something so special about a black and blue bezel. Uh, the one, it indicates the day and night sky. I've said this maybe 50 times on this channel before. But that simple idea of using color to communicate the intent of the feature, the, the function, it's brilliant. It's it is, uh, what do we say? What is the best word? It's genius, you could actually say. Uh, it's so simple, but it, it's so effective. And what makes it even better, I've had so many questions about this watch before. People asking, should I be picking this up? Should I be going for a Submariner? Should I be, I mean, the emails are great sometimes. And I've always recommended this because I believe it to be a piece that has such a great amount of visual complexity that it would never be boring for someone who might get bored easily with watches that they own. But you're also dealing with a watch that has such a nice set of complementary colors, black and blue. Talking about jeans, shirts, we tend to wear something with that color scheme every day. So it just works. And the Jubilee for extra comfort factor, it's got 200 meters water resistance. You're talking about a modern Rolex. This one to me does it so well. And this photo really captures it too. You get to see all those aspects. I hope that was a good little diatribe about the Batman. And I just saw a super chat. Thank you, Neo. By accepting this, you're committing to a 39 mil Explorer. You know what? I am pretty much 94.7% there. I am so keen. I'm so, so keen. Uh, I would love it. I know I would love it. As something simple, basic to wear every day. It's all I need. And as far as Rolex goes, it could be the only Rolex I'd ever need to own as well, right? For the next, what, 50 years of my life. That's a, that's a prediction, my lifespan. But yeah, talking about the Batman, Batgirl, the design, the, what, what bothers me so much, using social media, you get to see uh, Lucian's joining. Welcome. You just joined the show. Uh, social media really bothers me that these pieces are just being sold for. I mean, they're very rare, as Phillips would have you know. 94.7, what hell? <laughs> How the hell do you get there? There's lots of little factors, Mark. I, I, I apply certain percentages to every watch that I, you know, whatever. I'm just throwing numbers around, Mark. There's no, there's no validity. Uh, but the prices of these, I mean, they're going for double retail. And I just find that so, so uh, annoying for what this watch is. It's a steel piece. Anyway, moving next. This is also from JW. And this is another piece that he got recently. And I feel like looking at your wrist, JW, that you've had a bone sticking out here in the past. Because I'm, I know a lot of broken wrists, I've seen a few, and this kind of looks like one, but uh, <laughs> you could you could tell us if you ever, uh, you know, get in the chat. This Submariner was given to him for his birthday by his family, I think, and it's just your simple 114060. Funny, the last Batman that we saw was actually featured by a pool. Now we're looking at a Submariner by a pool. <laughs> Oh, these chats are good. I've got to catch that. That is some good stuff. I'm sorry that I'm missing all of you here. There were some tags in the minute. Um, underachieving watch collector, blender accident. The Explorer was my first luxury watch. You'd love it. 
I really think I would. I really do. And Orange Hand saying the remainder, 5.3% chance of Invicta. You know, you got it, you got it on the head there, Orange Hand. <laughs> it's a nice gift. I think he said that this was a watch given to him by his wife and his, his kids. As far as a birthday gift goes, maybe he gave it to himself, celebrating his 40s or squale. Oof. God love my I love myself a good squale. Uh, nice piece, really is simple, a little bit heavy duty. I don't know if the Submariner deserves a super case, but as far as modern transitional pieces go, it does a good job. Spoken about no date subs to death. Going to move on through. Now, this is a cool watch. I have never heard of it in my life, but you know, at quick glance, it looks like a Universal Geneve Compact. More specifically, the exotic blue Nina. So this is an homage given by Chrono Craze. As you can tell by his name, he's probably in the chat. Uh, Chrono Craze loves chronographs. And this is, how am I going to get this right? An Izumi Voiture Blue VQ2.601. Rolls off the tongue again. This representing the, the compact styling to it. And everything. I mean, what, what I love the most, uh, he mentions the bracelet, the Holzer bracelet. I'm considering getting one of these for my Seamaster, actually. You get them in, in uh, this is from Uncle Seiko, I think. You get them in 19 millimeters, which is ideal. Uh, but looking at just the parts and the elements, you've got the liar lugs again. Faithful recreation of a classic. And he did say that it's a watch that he'll probably never attain because these compact watches are very sought after nowadays. I don't know what they're going for. Someone might want to tell me in the vintage space what the desirability is like. But uh, we know Universal Geneva, along with vintage Hoyas and the rest, they are pretty hard to find. But seeing this comparison, I mean, you get, you get to enjoy all the elements that made it a late 60s piece. <laughs> Blaine, is that so? In Japanese, Nozumi means mouse or rat. Ooh, I did not know that. That's, that's pretty, pretty funny. Uh, Great. I mean, Blaine, are you are you based in Japan? We have a few Japanese guys who are based here, who are based expats based in, in Japan and other parts of the world. Uh, yeah, so I don't know what's going on in the chat, but uh, nice looking piece. I must say the combination looks superb. I do enjoy the inspiration, you know, behind the, the, the subdials, the, the way the subdials have been arranged here. It's a cool piece, very applied and just reminds you. So, I mean, you have a, you have a near identical Speedmaster seconds hand running there. Great watch, and the bracelet just completes it for me. Okay, moving on through Chrono Craze. Thank you for sending this in. We're jumping to Lane next. Now, Lane, this is one of the first and I think only modified Seikos that we're going to see. Oof, it's going. Oh, we do. We do have some more Seikos coming up in a sec. This is a P01 inspired Seiko mod sent in by Lane, and I really like the idea behind it. You know, the the, the P01 being Tudor. Oh, my soul. It even has a Tudor rose. That's so funny. <laughs> I mean, the modifying community, as we know, uh, everyone just goes ballistic with, with them. And uh, here we see a custom insert, custom dial. Uh, of course, the P01 having the offset crown kind of belongs on the Seiko. You get all of those aspects. So I thought that was a lot of fun. It's nice to feature the uh, the more. <laughs> uh, Joe, that's that's good. I've uh, That was me in high school, by the way. I would actually put my name on pages like that, handing in assignments and get in a lot of trouble. So when, when teachers read out that name in front of a class of an all-boys school, you've got to know it works. Uh, what's going on in the chat here? Main is saying, true about the meaning of Nizumi. Wow. Cons I was considering one but couldn't get past the name. That is so funny. Yeah, so talking about the P01, it's a bit of a polarizing piece for sure. And uh, <laughs> Joe... I was definitely not going to read that one out. That would have been uh, it's pretty good, though. I like it. I like your style. Snowflake, our hand, yeah, everything. Everything is is technically inspired by uh, all it doesn't have is the, the crazy end links that ratchet to the bezel. So this is quite a faithful recreation or inspired piece. Cleaner than the P01, Matthew says, in your opinion. Interesting. I do. I don't know if I'll be able to link it as well in the corner, but I will. I'm only allowed to link like five videos. But the P01 video... I talked about how it represents this transitional period where, you know, we are so used to receiving perfection. I mean, we get a watch like this. We pay a lot of money. We get a watch like this that is presented in the purest sense, as well finished as it could be. Uh, everything is intact. Everything's clean and clear, polished, brushed. 
when we jump to watches like the P01, it's a piece that, that really pays tribute to the prototypes, to, to the watches that have been developed. So instead of seeing the perfect watch, you now see something that represents that transitional phase, which is very interesting for the collector space, which is surprising why it is not so uh, desired for most people. They don't seem very interested because the aesthetics, so yeah, so it is. So it is. Moving next to Matthew Lane, thanks for sending this in. We get another glycine airman. This being a little bit different. This being just your a bit of a you know toned down variant next to the ones that we generally see. I uh, don't know what they call this the world timer. Okay, that's something. Is it a GMT? I really don't know. Oh, it's down to the bezel. The bezel is nicely set. Do enjoy the fact that the bezel doesn't have any any uh, paint inside it too. It simplifies the layout. It doesn't make it too cluttered. I uh, love the syringe hands. I mean, it's a go-to. It's a win. And they're not 70s syringe hands. They're very much like uh, more of your 60s era as you transition away from the 50s. Call them cricket bat style hands, you could almost say. Uh, and then you have the lock, the locking mechanism here. It's just great. I mean, Glycine as a brand, I want to focus on them more in future and maybe make a video. My plain Jane, Matthew says, oh, this is Matthew. Matthew from New Zealand. This is your piece. Love it. And the background too. I mean, we've got, this looks like Hampshire I see here and some carpet or jersey or something. It's great. I mean, a nicely laid out shot. And uh, this is in the States. No, I will never, I'll never guess Enfield. Five. You see, it's so difficult to tell whether or not you're talking. Then we've got Japan going on. I don't know what is cracking. Anyway, got a, got a guess, wild guesses. And I think you sent in another piece. Is this the same Matthew? No, it's not. There's some more Matthews coming up. <laughs> uh, it's a double 12. Raymond. It's a double 12. You're talking about the top. Oh, is this, we're talking about the top here. So it's not a 24 hour bezel. That's something. It's a 12 hour layout. Very good. 12 hour GMT. It's great. Really is. Going to carry on through. Matthew, thank you for sending this in. We've got a few more pieces to go. There are some who are coming. There's some who are going on the show. And South Island, New Zealand, Matthew. Oh, geez. See, I was, I was guessing and I botched it completely. The next Matthew, I don't know if this is the same, sends in a Lonco. Never heard of this. How am I going to say this right? A Langendorf. Is that where it was made? A Lonco from the 70s. So we've seen a few of these pieces that have integrated bracelets and cases. It's almost like we either see the sports casual pieces, the high-end dress watches, or we see integrated bracelets and cases on these watches. <laughs> uh, it's hilarious. I mean, it's, it's great. I love how no one knows what's going to be arriving, but you end up sending in such similar stuff. I've heard of Lonco. 73 Math says, I honestly haven't. <laughs> Good to know that one person has. Uh, I'd give my right arm to get back to Japan, Reed says. Fascinating. And you, you, you're coming up next, Reed, with your uh, your presage. Did you send a presage? No, what did you send in? Somewhere. I think you sent in a watch. I don't know. I've got to keep motoring. We've been running the show now for two and a half hours. And I want to say to everyone who's just maybe has just joined and you've missed out a lot of the show, that the first hour of the show is going to be processing by YouTube for 24 hours, which I think is a joke. Uh, because of what's been going on at the moment, they aren't prioritizing YouTube live streaming and processing. So it means that you miss out a big section, but you know, come Sunday evening, Monday morning, you'll be able to see the full extent of the show, which I'm sure will change. I also, also comment it in the chat. Uh, and at the end of the show, I'll, I'll add a comment at the, in the comment section. There's a few more video shots from Matthew, and I think this is also from him, and this is cool. Rolex Precision from 1945, Bukhara edition, and this is his grandfather's watch that he's wearing. Now, before that, I want to see, does anyone know this background and where this is? Someone please tell me. Otherwise, let's stay on this Rolex for a second. Rolex Precision, grandfather's watch. Reed saying motor on, yeah, for sure. Some other brand was the parent. Oh, that was it. So Langendorf, that was the, that was the family. That was the group. I think they were together. Uh, and Lonco and Langendorf were in, in the 70s. They were a group. But uh, yeah, jumping to the Rolex Precision, I think it's a real little gem. Where's the ceramic bezel? I know 73 math. I think he must have lost it. You know, his grandfather. How could his grandfather possibly have worn this watch without a ceramic bezel? It just ruins the value of the piece, I believe, you know. I think it's great. 1945. I mean, think about where this watch has been, what it's seen with a Bukhara stamp. That's something quite special. And I love the way the dial's been done. 
And I mean, look at what Rolex did back then. Remember the Rolex as a brand wasn't anything special. It was, it was a great brand, great manufacturer, waterproof case and all the rest. But I mean, they were so creative with their, with their approach. The bleach took it. <laughs> they were so creative with their ideas. So we're talking about Romans and hobnails and, and all those little aspects. Look at the presentation. It's definitely not for everyone, but I mean, this is his grandfather's watch. I love the fact that he hasn't polished the plexi. He's just left it the way it is. Uh, simple hand wound. Get to enjoy it. I'm sure it's hand wound. It does look like it. And got to carry on through. There's another Matthew. I think I think it was needs poly watch, as Matthew says. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It kind of, it'll kind of ruin the aesthetic. I mean, it keeps it looking old. Anyway, moving through to another Matthew. I don't know if it's the same. The same Matthew. No, it's a different Matthew. The last one didn't have tattoos on his arm. This being featuring, looks like a nice lab in the corner. Gotta love our dogs. Gotta love our dogs. I said hi. I said hello to a Pyrenean mountain dog today, and I cannot believe the size of them. If anyone knows what a Pyrenean mountain dog is, I mean, I've owned Bernese mountain dogs in the past. This makes a Bernese mountain dog look like a, a golden retriever <laughs> in size. A uh, Pyrenean mountain dog looked like the size of a, of a horse. Amazing animal. Mountain dogs have such amazing temperaments. I also love my Goldens and Labradors. Okay, Seiko Alpinist, SPB123J1. This being the, I think, released end of 2019, early 2020 with the Prospect branding. This is their new approach on the Alpinist. Spelling, flip and zipper. What did I spell wrong? Rolex Bucher may have base metal as plating. It wears off the crown. Beautiful, though. I'm sure they did. I mean, 1945, they were definitely playing around with plating in, in those days. You know, times were tough. <laughs> the world was tough, really tough. We think about crises. That one really was uh, quite a moment. Uh, reservoir. Foreman, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that has got to be one of the best. I'm, I, won't, I won't read that live, but uh, it's very good. Very accurate, too. Needs to be thicker, though. The tip needs to be thicker, though, to be a bit more practical. But uh, as far as it goes, that's funny. So Cathedral Hands, we have... Uh, we, funny, we've seen these. It looks just like the Vulcan Cricket, you know? Uh, the, the way the dial has been laid out with the indices. Of course, what they've done with regards to improvements here, they've put a Prospects movement inside the watch. 39 mils, 73 math. Yes, they've. They, I think they have shortened the size a bit. Uh, and... Cyclops lens is another thing. And there's mention about the, the spelling of, of the, the dog breed, flip and zipper, Pyrenean. Did I say that wrong? Pyrenean, Pyrenean, excuse me. I don't know. It's all a guessing game. But what makes the Alpinist cool is that it's, oh, he's also wearing it on a Jubilee. That's quite nice. What makes it cool is that you can adjust the inner bezel for your compass, because as we know, <clears throat> when you're wearing a watch nowadays, you need a compass to help navigate where you're going. How practical is it? Don't know. It would be nice if the compass actually worked independently and could point you to magnetic north. That would be pretty, pretty cool. Uh, but as far as this watch goes, I think there's one variant in this line. Made another video about the Seiko Alpinist. See if I can link that in the corner. Probably can't. About the... Actually, what I can do is maybe put time stamps in the comment section of this, this video. Um, all about the transition from where the Alpinist began and where it is now looks at like 80 or 90 years of history and goes through all the designs of the pieces. A lot of fun to make. Okay, Matthew, thank you for sending these in. And now we get to Megan. I don't know if Megan's still here. I mean, they, the, the founder timeless capital family, they, they generally don't get much sleep as it is. So I'd imagine they're probably knocked off by now, but the family has sent in 35 watches for me to archive. And I've just cherry picked five to show with all of you. So, in keeping with the theme of sports casual, still here, Megan, that's great. So you're just listening, it's fantastic. In keeping with the theme, and you please please tell me what this reference is because I really don't know. Uh, as far as sports casual watches go, this is a good starting point. Now, I've probably never, I don't think I've ever featured Richard Mill on the show before. And for the life of me, I have no idea what the reference is. Uh, it's an RM. It's a good starting point. I called it Bubba Watson, but it definitely isn't a Bubba. Maybe, it, maybe I don't know. Uh, but looking at the details, as far as Richard Mille goes, this is probably one that I would choose to wear. Why? Monotone in appearance. It's not flashy. It's not in your face. You can tell the time easily. The movement's small in scale. It's skeletonized completely, but you can appreciate the part as well as read the time. 
sadly, when you move up the echelons with Richard Mill, it gets very, very ugly, just saying that. I love the fact that Richard Mill attempts to address it as this concept watch. And to me, this feels like it. It's pure, it's simple and basic. Amin, thank you for the super chat. Please keep sending your watches in. I love the pieces that you have, your, your Mosa and all the rest. And <laughs> catching up with the chats, this, this really is something pretty stunning. Uh, I also just love the matte effect of the gray. You might see the gray strap, uh, the gray on the dial. It's beautiful, it really is stunning. So that's the one piece. People are already saying, wow, Megan. It's gonna get worse though, ladies and gents. I've, I've, honestly, I've taken the tame watches to show you all today because we're looking at sports casual and not high, high, high. This is, you could say, horterology, but we're not looking at the, uh, the real artisanal epitome, we could say. Uh, Mark's saying, a call out for Reed for 40 years this summer since he took his commission as US Marine officer. Wow, that is incredible. Well done. Congratulations, Reed. That is quite a story. And Mark, you were, you were in the RAF. So it's like, it's amazing how, how military gents seem to find their way onto the platform. Uh, we all love the same things. We love mechanics. We love things that work. And yeah, it, the RM I actually like. It's hell is freezing over. And the ferry on says, that's <laughs> so good. Uh, it's really funny. And Logan saying, thanks for the show. We're not done yet. It's going to get better. Trust me, it's going to get better. Richard Mill with no date. Okay, moving next. We're talking again about sports casual. Someone else helped me here. We're talking, we're dealing with a resence here. This is, a, I mean, I'm, I'm this good with naming. I called it the resence white. I really like what they've done here too. I think the, uh, not only the layout, but the, 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 the styling of what the way this watch is arranged. To tell the time, it's fairly simple. Uh, winding it and everything is done at the back. Rescence, as Marco Marco is asking, Rescence is the name, and uh, it's actually all it's fully oil filled. It's a very complicated watch, actually. It's it's a real. We're talking about concept pieces. This is it. So look it up on on YouTube. I know Tim Tim Mosso does a lot of reviews of these pieces, and it's incredible. You set you set and wind the entire watch from the back, the case back, oil filled completely. The movement I think is covered with the oil as well, and. It's fully functional. How can I explain how to read it? So this looks to be the date complication at the base here. So it's the 9th. Whoops, come back. Oh, I'm lucky I didn't spoil that. This is your power reserve indicator here. So that's your winding. This is your temperature indicator. I don't know what that's about. This is maybe your running seconds. I don't know. Then you have your hours. So you can see it's coming up to 6 and it's 45. So it's actually 5.45 at the moment. This whole dial, inner dial, rotates. It's a crazy looking thing. Have a look. Watch box, resonance watches, and you'll see all the details. So again, what an amazing, peculiar piece that I've never featured on the show. Thanks to Megan uh, for sending this in. I think it was Megan or Jacinta. Jacinta, Jacinta, do it there. Jacinta sent this watch in, and uh, I think Megan was wearing this one day. Next, moving on through. So a different Spy by Future. It's definitely uh, industrial. I love the industrial design. 37 and a half mils of oil in this piece, milliliters. It's amazing. I mean, it's so, so peculiar. Okay, moving on, moving on <laughs> to the next piece. We have a gorgeous, and I hope I'm saying it's a pioneer and not an endeavor. I get so confused. Moza Fume, I said, tobacco burst dial. Moza does Fume the best in the business, and we've talked about Moza often enough. I think it's one of the most exciting and interesting modern classical takes on dress watches today. Look at that dial. Look at the way they do their script. There's no detail. There's no telling you about the, the water resistance or the movement, anything. It's just all you need. Handset, batons, everything works well together. Organic case styling. What else do you need to say? Moser knows what's up and knows what they're doing. And uh, yeah, there's all sorts of things going on in the chat. Everyone's listening. It's great. Smoky. Yeah, it feels just like a tobacco burst, you could say. I'm sure they probably call it like a tobacco burst dial. Oof. We're not done yet, though. This is only how many? We've only done three of the pieces, hey? We've got two more, which are just as cool. Moser being Moser. And it's a brand that, uh, as we know, has just recently been bought. I mean, 2012, I think, the family bought the name. And it's incredible to see how they have, you know, retooled the brand itself and transitioned into this new era. I love that they don't take themselves too seriously as well. They like to spoof. They like to spend money on places where they shouldn't. 
but who cares because they can just do what they want. They own, they own their own uh, shop and show. So that's the way it is. Moving on next. And I liked this setting. The reason why I featured the Moser first and the Bulgari second, or well, this is actually a different Bulgari, but you know, it's Octo Venissimo. Why not? It's a watch I love to hate. Uh, and another shot. I think Megan actually wore this like yesterday, if I remember right. And uh, yeah, Octo is a great piece. I don't know what metal. This looks like white gold. It does look like white gold to me, but uh, you might need to correct me there. Maybe it's stainless steel. It looks a bit more polished. I don't know. But the Octo Finissimo, again, we've had a look at 70s inspired watches. I've criticized this watch a lot in the past because the design styling don't get much. But uh, the color looks unreal. So let me know if this is white gold because I feel like it might be. Uh, interesting looking piece. There are lots of people who have these watches and they just adore them, especially just the standard brushed pieces that are the thing that makes them so great is that they wear almost like a a cuff on the wrist. They have a lot of presence, but at the same time, they're so thin, like the thinnest movements in the world that you can just wear them low and, and to the wrist, under the radar, under a sleeve. Yeah. And this is, yeah, this belongs to uh, the, the founder Timeless Capital family. Going to carry on through to the last piece that was sent in, and it's one of my favorites. Are we ready for this? This is something I've never seen featured on the show before. Uh, white gold, blue dial. How did I guess? Thank you, Megan. I just thought because it's a little bit more polished, it looks a little bit more uh, crisp. For last but not least, we're looking at, and I hope I got this right. I'm guessing, would you, would you like, oh, this is good, Foreman saying, would you mix the squared forms with the circular bezel? <sighs> wall banger, Clam says. I mean, you walk into the wall with this, imagine. There's, I just find it too... Okay, one thing I like is that the, it looks very much like it's been inspired by the Art Deco movement. Reminds you of the Empire State Building. You know, that that kind of style and effect. But the circular and square forms, I just think it's too chiseled. It's just too complex, too visually complex. They could possibly reduce it in a few places to improve the uh, the visage. But, you know, Octo Finissimo, we're talking about how the, the Octo effect has been laid out inside the bezel, which is something strange. But it also lies on the outside. It's great. I mean, talk about visual complexity. This watch has it in spades. You notice how the, the octagonal effect is underneath the bezel and follows through onto the outside of the case. But it's all the stepping on the lugs. And, you know, it's, it's a peculiar watch, but I'm sure it wears like a charm. And, uh, yeah, it's layered or py pyramidal, py pyramidal. I've been doing the show for over two hours. I'm not even going to try and pronounce that. Uh, great looking piece, though, Megan. And last but not least, we are going to feature... Now this piece, I'm guessing, I'm gonna take a wild guess, I hope I get this right. It's a Breguet Type 21, and it's a transatlantic, or transatlantic. And it is a flyback double, it's a flyback split chronograph, I think. And these are very rare, and interesting, and peculiar. And sports casual, again, falls into that camp. Breguet Type 21 or Type 22, I think. Or vulgary for some. <laughs> that's a great marker. I like that. That's that's a good expression there. Nice layout. I don't know if this is white gold or if it's steel or, or, or whatever else, but dial color we're talking about, uh, as mentioned by by Russell, it's got this very flat, you know, muted gray, uh, faux tina. Whether you love it or hate it, it's up to you. But look at the script. It's Breguet, and Breguet goes to town with cursive with their type and their font. I love it. The way they do the date windows here, and they, you know, it's almost like this this obscure. What, what would you say? What's the best way to explain it? Obtuse arrangement to how the angles work with the day when the date the, the, the date windows, big numbers. I mean, you can read it easily, right? Uh, and it's a double split chronograph, or it's a split it's a split time flyback chronograph. So it's one hell of a complication. Uh, it's gorgeous. It really is a stunning watch, and that is from the founder family. Thanks to Megan and Jacinta for sending these pieces in. Uh, titanium. Is, is this piece in titanium? I don't know if it is, Demetrius. Thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I mean, what a set. Five pieces. I definitely uh, kept it simple for all of us to have a look at. I didn't go to the trapezoid. Thank you, Reed. That's a much better expression. <clears throat> look how the dial is stepped as well. Okay, now moving on next. Megan, thank you for sending these. Or should I say Jacinta, thank you for sending them. Megan, thank you for wearing these watches and for the rest of the family who's been wearing these watches to send them through. Next up, we're jumping to Mr. C. And this is one of my favorite submissions for the show. Why do I say that? 
The answer is pretty obvious. Are we ready? First off, we have an orange amplifier. Whoops, orange amplifier in the background, which is a nice touch. We've got a pedal board, but you can understand why I like this watch, just looking at its appearance. <clears throat> I'll leave it on the screen for a second and I'll refresh the stream again. I think it's slowed down a bit. <laughs> Mr. C, $1, I think that's great. I mean, that's just so typical, right? Mr. C has just a standard 2008 Rolex OP 116000 on a rubber B strap. And look at the way they have done the dial with this watch. I think as a combination, can you get any better when it comes to highlights, when it comes to color contrast, the way the dial has been done here? This is the Air King 05. Now you have to ask yourself, why didn't they do this with the Air King? You know, I uh, think it is such a gem. Charming, simple. It doesn't look like a Rolex, but at the same time, it kind of has this uh, funky roulette transitional effect to it as well. Uh, Here's the 5505 we're talking about, the Furion, and uh, Harley watch. Is that what they, is that the distinction? Is it linked to Harley Davidson? I really don't know. But the orange highlights, it just works. It just really does work as a package. That's one hell of a pedal board you have there. Holy smokes. What, what kind of ampage does it take? And orange amplifiers. I'd love to see your guitars, Mr. C, if you'd ever like to share with us one day. And maybe with a $1 note that would just add to the, to the experience. Uh, yeah, just stunning. This is one of my favorite watches of the show because it's not trying hard to show off. It is actually just so plain and basic. And it's what Rolex really does. I mean, compared to the professional models that we see all the time, it's so nice to see a Rolex that is just that. Basic, no nonsense. And Megan's saying it's got the Air King numerals. Yeah, it does. And they address the five correctly, which is a nice touch. And also in the Air King numerals as the Arabics at the quarters too. Another aspect to highlight here. So they basically took the, the blue dial variant and this looks like it's also loomed as well. I don't know. Such a nice combination. I mean, this deserved to be a cover photo shot too because the colors just work, just work. Thank you, Mr. C, $1. Moving next to Nick. Oh, cool. We have another uh, 16570 from year 2000 Polar with hollow center links and some wear and tear. You can see the bezels being used in its life, which is always appreciated. And this is going to end up being a three and a half hour show, damn it. <laughs> uh, Rolex turned it up to 11 here, Nefirion. That's good. That's that's good. Nice take on that. Talking about amplifiers and everything. It's nice. Uh, and Reed saying there is a Rolex Air King with a similar dial, one to 12 Roman numerals. I'd love to see that. And so it goes. I mean, yeah, another polar. There are, it's, I think we've had one show in the past where we had about five Polar Explorers, which is incredible. But I do like the synchronization between everything. And yeah, it's a gem. Can never go wrong with it. I do love it when the dial is, is clean like this. I also like the fact that you can see the, the date window and everything's nice and clear, clean and easy to read. Ah, it's a gem. Moving on next to Nick. We just moved from Nick, sorry, to Randy. <laughs> I tell you what. You know, at, at the three-hour mark, my brain starts to uh, waver. Seiko Presage, known as the Honeycomb, and he sent me this full description explaining how the Honeycomb dial was inspired. And apparently it's from a drink, a very special drink cocktail, should I say, at a very certain bar in Japan. Now, we know Seiko takes the inspirations from all over the place, but this one is quite an interesting one. Have a good look at the dial and the details there if you can. Seiko Presage being a dress watch that you would wear. I do enjoy the, the idea that it's you know, inspired by a drink. We've had the cocktail time, I think, is another reference. <laughs> Don't fade on us, <laughs> Reed says. <laughs> uh, I'm going to take another hit of the wine. Oh, I need to drink some more. I haven't actually finished the glass yet. Right. Seiko Presage, honeycomb, Mr. C, $20. Holy smokes, that's, that's $21. In, in, in as a separate unit. Thank you, Mr. C. Absolute pleasure. And I have to say, this is definitely one of my favorite watches of the show. It is so classy what you've done here. Pairing it with the amp, it's brilliant. It's actually genius. Orange amp, you clearly love it. I mean, one could swear you were Dutch. <laughs> anyway, carrying on through to uh, 
This piece looks great. And he also sent in a shot of the movement, Seiko Presage movement. Limited edition, again, inspired by a very certain drink that I didn't name. I didn't actually put into the description of this. But uh, I think as far as inspiration goes, Seiko really knows to take it to the next level. I mean, who, who goes out of their way to be inspired not only by a drink, but by a drink at a certain bar in a certain place in Japan? You know, it's like, what? It's just, it's just the thing. Anyway, thank you for this, Randy. Going to carry on through because as it is, we're lagging. Now, this piece, I hope I'm getting this right. This comes from Raymond, and I think Raymond just picked up this watch. Just picked it up. It's a reference 2531.80. And this is a 2006 kind of area, I think, like the Casino Royale time, just as we were transitioning out into the... Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong here. This might be just as we got to the automatic variant of this piece. But he's wearing it on a Bond NATO, pretty standard. And it looks good. This is actually the first old school professional that we've had on the show. It's nice how we seem to blend here. We have vintage, we have modern, as it always is. And I feel like you picked this up new old stock. I think this was from you. <sighs> can't remember. I really can't. But I've got to carry on here. We're going to be lagging behind so much. But thank you for this, Raymond. It's always good. And you sent in more. Here we go. Yima. Yima Superman. Superman. Bronze. I didn't realize this until recently. Actually, 1999, Raymond. Thank you. So we're talking, what was that film? The World Is Not Enough. No? No, no, no. What is it? No. What am I saying? Uh, Die Another Day. This feels like the Die Another Day version. No? Maybe. Can help me there. So the Yima Superman, I didn't realize this, but this little clasp you see on the, on the bezel is the locking component. So in order to actually use the bezel, you have to unscrew the crown. <laughs> Talk about the practicality. He sent in two, one with, uh, with a bronze finish and one with stainless steel. In order to use the bezel, you have to unscrew the crown, adjust it, and then screw it back down again. So 990 feet. I mean, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and this, that comment coming from Shane, that's good. Uh, so as far as, as peculiarity goes, it must suck when you're in the water. Imagine being submerged like, what, 50 meters and realizing that you have to adjust the bezel, but you can't. And then you just decide, yeah, I'm going to stupidly unwind the crown. And so you get uh, contamination. Oxymoron. What is the oxymoron? Please tell me. <laughs> Die another day. Is that it? <laughs> Raymond, I don't know. <laughs> you know, it's been three hours. I'm just, I'm just running on fumes at the moment. Uh, but yeah. As a combination goes, this is the standard version in steel. You can see that he loves the piece. It's a nice looking watch. I mean, it takes those Submariner elements, but uses a much more attractive set of pencil hands that I kind of like. I really do like this. Uh, and, and the hands, I mean, this the second hand reminds me of the, the Seiko Willard 6105. I just love it. The inspirations and where they come from, I just don't know. But it's always a treat, Raymond. I have to carry on because the last half an hour of the show, I think we're going to spend on these amazing pieces. So let's just carry on through. Thank you for these, Raymond, if you're there. 39 mil, good to know. Yima is handsome, very different and unique. Why the name Superman? Someone please address that in the chat because I really don't know. Moving on next, uh, this is the second Oyster Perpetual 39 we've had, but with an interesting strap. So this is from Robert. This is an Oyster 39 on a Kudu leather strap. Yima is such a great brand from France, Megan says. Thank you for that. Yes, I mean, I didn't even mention it. I should have, on the, on the base of the dial, it says France. I do like the fact that a company can, or a country can represent themselves without having to say anything like made in or just the name of the country, France. It's great. Please someone, please someone mention what Superman's about. But uh, what do you think about the OP39 on a kudu strap? Now, I, coming from a place called South Africa, can tell you that Kudu Bultong is probably the best you can get. Uh, there's Bultong is basically beef jerky, but just done <clears throat> in a much more plain and simple way. Chip Gage, thank you so, so much for the Super Chat, really. I hope you've enjoyed it. Really, everyone who's been a part of the show, you make it the fun. So uh, showing us the, show us the heavy hit. Don't worry, Joe. It's going to happen soon. We'll get there. Speaking of which, I starting to sound like Michael Jackson. I'm going to hit the fisherman's friend, get back in. OP39, kudu strap. Bultong is basically a South African version of beef jerky. Done very simply, prepared, very basic. But uh, kudu bultong tastes incredible. 
this is a fantastic shot robert is that an mg in the background maybe someone can help is that a triumph maybe but this shot i mean oh this was close to becoming a cover photo i just couldn't arrange it in such a way uh, and there's mention about the email saying french air force 60s raymond thank you i need to list this down in my uh french armed forces video that i've been working on for the last couple of months is that a mercedes does it does it look like it kind of does do you call that a pagoda it definitely does look like a mercedes see by the headlights oof it looks so good but you see this watch in its natural habitat and there's mention that this is the watch for the watch for me dimitri says demetrius uh looks like a mercedes 190 you guys are good with your cars hey uh talk about the op i must say the 39 is a watch that appeals to me a lot but uh, most versus how rolex it really is and it definitely doesn't scream rolex for sure when i look at these two i mean you know rationally i look at this and the explorer i would find that the batons i would just get tired of i feel like they're just it's just too simple for my taste if they brought out a, a watch similar to this with a with a 369 layout i might consider it differently but I think that the plain baton layout is just too, too basic for me. I need an X factor. That's where the Arabics come in, but it is a gorgeous piece. And on a Kudu strap, just completes it. I think we've had a few 39s. This is the second one for the show. But uh, as far as Rolex goes, I'm going to make it, I'm actually working on a video all about the OP39, telling everyone why it is, I can't remember what the title was, something like one of Rolex's best approaches, because it just, again, glorifies what made Rolex Rolex back then in the 30s. Oyster case, all that tells you it's a Rolex is that it has this beautiful crown, gorgeous dial, it's all you need, and it doesn't draw attention to itself. Perfect, simple watch. Austin Healy, this definitely does look like a Merc. I'm looking at the window and the back section. Maybe someone can tell me otherwise. The bumper does look a bit peculiar though. Ah, oh, I don't know. Anyway, Rob, thank you for sending this in. Gonna carry on through to Rick next. Now, let me try and get this out. This is a reference 6139-6010. <laughs> We're coming up to the three hour mark, so I'm going to have to uh, get to the heavy hitters in a sec. His dad, his uncle who was in the Air Force gave this watch to him when he graduated high school, I think, and he's worn this all his life. So there's quite a history to it. And he gave me a full description, which I really, really uh, struggled with recording. But basically, he's had this all his life, and it's another one of those watches that has been worn and used extensively. I think he's had a few parts changed over time, but as a, another piece inspired by 70s motifs, you can just see it all the way. b -Dev saying, please, please do not buy a 39 Explorer. Buy the 36. Is that a Pogue? Megan says, very well said. I think he mentioned that this is the precursor to the Pogue. Maybe. First auto chrono in space. Eric says, was I right? Is it the precursor to the Pogue? <laughs> I think we're getting somewhere. Uh, I don't know. Someone please tell me. Uh, but it's a great looking watch. I mean, the, the vibrant blue on the dial. And it's amazing to see how this watch has lasted so long. Now, B-Dev, talking about the Explorer, it's a watch that I'm kind of hooked on. It's kind of like a drug. So we'll see. We'll see how it goes. I won't be getting it anytime soon. Let's be real. I mean, geez. Unless there's a GoFundMe set up, no chance. But uh I'd love to review one if anyone would like to send one in. Okay, carrying on through, Rick, thank you for sending this in. And we jump into another Seiko. This is a Seiko Landmaster. <laughs> Seiko Landmaster Spring Drive. Hold on, any more references? No. Now, Landmaster, you think to yourself, Omega should have this name with their pieces. Uh, but this piece having a power reserve indicator, crown at the top, what a peculiar looking piece. Reminds you of a of a pocket watch in a way, a modern pocket watch. Never seen one of these before, but I do appreciate that they've addressed the text quite nicely on the dial. I don't know where it sits in the scheme of, uh, should it be an explorer's watch? Is it an everyday wearer? Who knows? But I do like that he's loomed it up for us to see. And this is from Tech. I didn't mention Tech sends this watch in to us all. I don't know if he's in the chat, but uh, let's talk about Pogue crazy real JDM model, JDM meaning Japanese domestic market. And we can see Japan branded. I'm sure the sake this last one was as well. Yep. Another JDM. Always good. It's nice. And I mean, they're the most sought after Japanese domestic market. Anything is what people want because that's where the quality lies. 
uh, with their pieces. It's when they're starting to be made in Malaysia and other places do you start losing a lot of the flair that the JDM models offer. Okay, Tech, thanks for sending this in. Very interesting watch that I have never seen, ever. Triforce Rich. Now, he was in the chat earlier, I think, but he has left the chat. And he sends in another Seamaster, but this being the Spectre Seamaster. And the clear distinctions, you can see that there's no 12 at the top of the dial. The Amiga logo has been uh, sized up ever so slightly. We have a GMT style bezel and what many love, lollipop style seconds hand, white accent. So this we started seeing, if I remember right, the CK2913 uh, reference number five, I think, the fifth transition at that point where we started to see the lollipop hand. And uh, again, the history is amazing. Look up the original Seamaster professional history, not professional, the real Seamaster, the original Seamaster diver. And you'll learn all about the various references in between. My one is based on a, a dash one or a dash three. This is based on more of a dash five to dash seven ish. But the Spectre is a great watch. I mean, talk about the movement, it's all the same. Uh, love the GMT aspect to it as well. It's quite practical. Um, why naught instead of 12 on the bezel? I have no idea. Good point. It does aesthetically look a bit better, honestly. I think when you're dealing with three, it does look quite clean and tidy. It lines up with your Omega logo nicely. When you're dealing with two numerals and then you're putting the third set, it's kind of cluttered in this top corner. But uh, seeing the naught there is something different. It would be nice if that was loomed as well, but who knows? Also, on a, on a James Bond-inspired strap, I don't know if this is Omega standard or not. But a uh, great piece, Triforce. This is the third Seamaster that we've seen. We've seen all the options that they, they allow. My one, the 57, uh, Dear Artifacts Dad with the, the original 300M, and then this being the Spectre variant. Great, it's great. Next up, Tetley, are you in the chat? This is quite a gem. What makes this watch special? CWC, new old stock, Desert Storm, supplied, or made for the Gulf War. And this watch is in fantastic condition. It looks like it actually uses tritium on the dial. Look at that arrangement. Holy smokes, that looks good. Talking about the, the color scheme and the oof, caramel effect. Look at it. And the numerals, look how well the numerals have been done here too. Again, say that Desert Storm made for the Gulf War. These watches didn't actually go out there, I don't think. Uh, that the contract, maybe the war ended by that point in time. But I must say, it looks good. China Watch Company, as Marco says, well, technically it says Swiss made, and it, it actually means Cabot Watch Company, if I'm not wrong. Again, watches of the armed forces. I've probably linked that somewhere in the series already, as it is. Anyway, got to carry on through. I love the layout here. This coffee brown finish to it. It looks so clean and beautiful. Moving next to our man, Thomas. Thomas, who is based in France, he sends in, oh, it's coming back to bite me, you see? See what happens. When we start talking about explorers, so they pop up. Uh, 39 millimeter, another 214270. And this watch being Thomas's everyday wearer, he loves this piece. And I must say there's something so cool about seeing a bezel that's been, oh no, come back. Seeing a bezel that's been used and worn in. That was just great. Uh, I don't know if these are scratches or not. They probably are. Thomas really likes to use his pieces. Uh, and he has an amazing collection. I actually did a full collection review of his pieces a couple of months back. And uh, he has lots of vintage. But this is one of his modern Rolexes that he owns, and he just loves it. So, you know, ladies and gents, I think the writing is on the wall about this piece. Really don't know. I have to give them a nod for proudly proclaiming their courts. That's a good point, CWC, uh, Blaine. Um, okay. Going to carry on, Thomas. Thank you for sending this in. It's good to see another explorer on the show. Let me jump into Thomas Burnett, who I think I have seen in the chat. I think, Thomas, you sent a super chat in earlier that I think I missed. And it was something like, Thomas, I'm sorry about that. Eh? Uh, I, th I think I did catch a glimpse of it. You mentioned um, for the Explorer Fund. <laughs> it's great of you, Thomas. Thank you. And I'm so glad that we were able to catch up and chat via WhatsApp and everything. It's awesome. Such a gent. Thomas is the most down-to-earth, the most salt of the earth, the most committed watch enthusiast on this platform, I would say. He is currently wearing Aragon prototypes sent to him by uh, Megan and the family. 
uh, I'm sure they'd be sending these watches to me, but because my wrists are literally the size of ladies' wrists, I would never be able to pull off 42 mils. But I do really enjoy the way he's matched colors here. So we're dealing with, this is called a proto blue, and then he's also got a proto green. And you notice these cases are like 48 mils. They are monsters. But I love how he's matched the garden there. It's, it's nice. Thomas tends to use these watches while gardening, so that's always great. But these colors are fantastic. You like to see the vibrance on the dials. And just as far as an everyday wearer, 200 meters, 660 feet. I must say the blue catches me a bit more. I love that effect. So that, that aquamarine color really is striking all the way. But as far as overbuilt divers, we've seen quite a few of them, and it's it's amazing how it's in its own field at this point. I don't know much about Aragon as a brand, but maybe maybe you can clear it up a bit more uh, if Megan's in the chat still or whatever else. I think I need both a 36 and 39 together, my two pennies <laughs> from 73 math. Oof. Yeah. I don't know. You know, money money is always hard to come by, so it's it's that idea of how am I going to budget for it? And it's going to be a year's time at least, I think, if I'm lucky. Okay, Thomas, you sent these in a while back. It's great to feature them. The second hand is cool. Yeah, there's something about this. Reminds me of an Atom. Maybe that's what they were going for. I really don't know. But uh, the counterbalance being loom is always something special. Okay, I've got to move through because we've got a few more pieces to go. This was one of the last submissions for the show uh, from Tom. He sends in an Omega chrono stop, and I have never seen this arrangement before. That's how you wear it. I mean, how amazing is that? So the watch is actually facing you like a racing, uh, racing chronometer. And the idea behind the chrono stop, I feel like it's almost this regatta timer hybrid made for pilots to use to uh, determine their, what's the term? Uh, their, their docking, docking times, what am I saying? their flight route, just before they take off, they have to, they have intervals where they have to wait before they can actually take off or when they're coming into land. What, what is the, the proper expression? I'm sure there's a few pilots. Curtis, if you're in the chat, please tell me what I'm trying to say. Uh, this, this arrangement here is quite special. So there's no, there's no sub dial or anything. It's just a simple 60 minute counter. And I think that layout is just stunning. Notice how the racing dial works. The handset, where does that handset come from? 1655. Orange highlights on the on the sub, this is the running seconds. Uh, nice arrangement, very cool. So you've got a single pusher and you've got a crown. It's an amazing piece. I think it really is a racing watch. I think someone mentioned, Megan said, Amiga Geneva racing cars is a classic. Yeah, it's nice. Neo saying, I'm a consultant, increase your rate, take on more gigs, explore one by Christmas. <laughs> if anyone would like to pay for some design consulting gigs, I'd like to get back into it in a bit more detail. I definitely haven't done much consulting over the last few months, but you know, it's the way it is. Tom Austin, I didn't save your pics of the CQ on the C. I stopped saving photos by like midday today. So sorry if I didn't get them from you. Uh, take off and landing intervals. Thank you, Curtis. That's what I was trying to say. Uh, really nice piece. I think the way they've done the arrangement here, again, it's so typical late 60s and 70s, but you know, it's the way it is. Okay, I've got to fight, you know, work my way through these because as it is, this is going to be longer than three and a half hours at this point. T. Taylor sends in a selection of gorgeous Grand Seikos. You can't see them very well. I think I screenshotted these because they were sent to me via Google Drive, and I can't save them very well. Anyway, Seiko Four Seasons. Let me get this list down. <clears throat> Hold on. Seiko Four Seasons Spring Drive Spring Drive What Spring Edition Pink Sky Flake Blue Hue Dial. And the Mount Iwate Elegance, blue dial, S SKB, blah, blah, blah. So basically we have pink, uh, beautiful blue, and sky blue. These are some of the most sought after Grand Seiko pieces. If I'm not wrong, you can only get the uh, spring edition pink, these models. Oh, look at that dial. You can only get these in America. I think they were only designed, they're only made and brought out for the American market. Look at that dial. Again, Seiko and their inspiration and their textures looks like a cloud, and I think it looks sublime. Uh, as far as an everyday wearing watch, yes, you could get away with this. Talking about salmon dials again, I think, Reed, you sent in that, uh, that Mont Blanc. It's what's going to be featured next week, talking about salmon dial watches, funnily enough. What a beautiful dial. Again, apologies for the resolution. I think I might have screen grabbed this, but uh, yeah, as a pairing, 
What a great watch. It stands out for sure. Okay, I've got to keep motoring. This is, I mean, taking way too much time up. Right. So Vaughn. Vaughn sends in an Aquaterra World Time. Probably one of the most underrated watches out there at the moment. Uh, you're dealing with a World Time complication and slot times, Curtis. That's an even better expression. Thank you. I didn't know that. So World Time. Probably one of the most underrated pieces in the line because it's just so underrated and basic and simple. Uh, 41 mils, easy to wear sports watch, but you get a world time complication and it really does stand out a lot. Uh, there was a mention, I think there was talking about, uh, no, I missed, I missed a part in the chat, I don't know. Uh, talking about the 70s design, as Ricky mentions, the, the case shape, for sure, love that. The styling is so unique. And with this, the Aquaterra has managed to transcend into a different point where they've been able to really look at the sports watch in a different way, different insight. Okay, Vaughn, thank you. This was Vaughn at an AD. He was trying this on. I think he's seriously considering it and talking about value for money. I mean, I would love to get, there's one great variant of this in gold that I think looks stunning. Okay, last shot from Wendy. Wendy sends in her boyfriend's Black Bay 58. We have to have a lady featured as well as Megan on the show. And uh, Wendy is a, is a longtime viewer. And this is great being able to feature some more ladies on the show. So she's wearing, a, a, I think it's a leather strap. And can someone please tell me about the alcohol here? Because I am, oh, it's a whiskey, four roses. Looks great. It definitely has been polished off. But this is the only Black Bay black we've had on the show. How's that? We've seen a Black Bay uh, Blue Navy not the 58, the original. Uh, I think it looks just great. Stunning with a black leather jacket as well. Nice and clean. Tudor, as Zane says, yeah, or Tudor. S-H, oh, sorry, C-H-E-W-U-D-A. I probably botched that one up, but you know. I've been doing this for three hours, so my brain has gone flat, but we're going to move on next. Thank you for this, Wendy. I think I should put you further up in the list. I'll, I'll, I don't know, rename you somewhere different. Right. Moving on. Let's get to the heavy hitters. Are we ready? This is going to be for the next, I would say, 20 minutes of the show. Here we go. Here we go. First off, Zane. Zane sends in a Patek 6007A. The story goes, and I don't know if this is the case or not, but our man Russell... We featured this watch last show. Our man Russell scored a Lunga Odysseus and the Boutique Edition Patek. And uh, Russell returned his Boutique Patek. He didn't like it. And Zane said in the email to me that uh, it didn't say Lunga on the dial. That's why he returned it. I think it's just great. I don't know if Russell's still here, but uh, it's a really good jab, Zane. Nice, nice touch there. And it's such a peculiar piece, but I think I really do like it. I enjoy the way they've done the carousel layout of the numerals on the dial. The way the texture works, it's a very peculiar watch. But as far as a collector's item, you know it is. Yeah, Zane, no, Russell is here. That's good. I love I love that comment. He returned it because it didn't say longer on the dial. And uh, I know the reason why he returned it. I can pretty much imagine that Russell is infatuated with his Odysseus at the moment, and that's all he's been wearing. He's put it aside for a rubber strap at the moment, I think. Anyway, this is not the, the hero of the show, though. No, we're going to be looking at something a little bit more special. So let's just start with these uh, quickly. <laughs> now, Russell and I have been in contact. We've been chatting recently, and Russell has an amazing past. He collected Ulysses Nardin, primarily. Nardin, Nardin. And... He, or oh, Mason says, are oh, those numerals loom filled? Yes, they absolutely are. <clears throat> so he started to diversify his portfolio and uh, he's, he's now in the Lunga scape. And these are probably two of the most sought after and collectible Lungas in the family. What makes them work so well? Both of them glow in the dark. We're talking on the right hand side, we have the Lunga datograph lumen. When I saw this watch released, blew my mind. I, I screenshotted it. I set it as my wallpaper on my phone for like a month because I just thought to myself, what have they done here? No worry. We'll see them glowing in the dark in a second. Uh, and then on the left-hand side, we have a Zeitwerk Phantom, probably the most expensive Lunga in the family. I don't know so much. But what makes these watches unique, you can see that Lunga isn't covering up the details in their dials. You can see that the large date 
is on display back there, similar to the Zeitwerk Phantom. I guess this is where they get the name Phantom from is because the numerals are everywhere. Now, let's have a look. What shots could I show you? Okay, let's start with, so this is the presentation. We get to see them both here. Z watches does good, yeah. <laughs> Moving to the, the A, I call this AR coating. We get to see what that looks like in more direct light. And again, you get to see the texture. Look at the pearlage inside the movement and everything. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous pieces. I really enjoy that the Phantom has green stitching on its strap to match the loom on the, uh, the dial. Okay, now what do we look at next? Not looking at the movement yet. We're going to look at UV glow. Oof, there we go. So Russell managed to take a nice slow exposure or long exposure shot. I'm not a, I'm not a photographist, so correct me if I'm wrong there. But he managed to take a snapshot of what happens when this watch changes time at the hour. And it's just perfect. I think it's so well done. Under the UV light, we get to appreciate the loom. Russell, you just did such a good job here. Thank you for sending these in. And you get to see all the details. This is what it looks like glowing in the dark. The numerals are just all over the shop. And you can see as it flicks over, I mean, it's mesmerizing. Russell has a YouTube channel. He's on here. And short exposure, thank you for that. Uh, he has a channel and he features all of these watches on the channel as a small little run through of them changing time and everything else. So the Zeitwerk Phantom, you can see it's quite the Enigma watch. It's definitely not a watch for everyone. It reminds us of Comeback. Uh, it reminds us of, uh, you know, there's pocket watches and grandfather clocks of the time. And uh, it's just, it's just beautiful. But we're not done yet, though. I think we have something else to add. Yes, we do. Oh, geez. So now we have, I call this glow. This is the direct light we get to appreciate now. Once it's been loomed up, you can see why I like the data graph lumen so much. And I actually asked him, how practical is this watch to read in the dark? I'd love to know how easy it is to use the chronograph. Uh, I think they just nailed the data graph. The only longer I've ever handled is a data graph platinum before. And whew, this is quite something special. Photography by Russell. I mean, we have to clap, clap him in the chat for he's done such a good job here. And I think he did these all for me. I mean, that's how dedicated he is to these shows. He took all these photos to show me and, and share with all of you. So really, Russell, I can't thank you enough. Uh, Lumen for the win, as Austin says. That's the thing. I mean, what do we choose? L or Phantom? L or P? What do we say? Who goes with what? I'd actually like to know. In the comments right now, L or P? I'm hitting the coffee. And this, and don't worry, the, the last, there's last, uh, last watch that's coming up you'll be very interested in. What are we thinking? What would you take over these two? Would you take the Phantom? Or would you take the Data Graph? Data Graph all the way for me. Phantom for Orange Hand, Lumen for Underachieving, Lumen again, Patek, Zane. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, Zane. That's just boring. That's just boring. But your watch is spectacular, as you're going to hear me gushing over it because it deserves to be seriously looked at. B for both, Tom says, LNP, truly exceptional. They really are. I mean, these are the upper topper, upper topper echelon. <laughs> For Lunga as a brand, and I must say, they're both in platinum, right? Both in platinum, both seriously unique. I mean, you, there's only like a couple hundred of these in the world, if I'm not wrong. And uh, you just know, really unique and different. Oh, and don't worry, we haven't missed out the most, <laughs> the most important part. Oops. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the movements and really the 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 way they've addressed complications here. Shaitan is joining us <laughs> at the very end of the show. <laughs> uh, Zane, I need to get... No, but the thing is, Mark, Zane likes the idea of going last because um, his watches are generally as great as Russell's. So we get to see... What I like is Russell and Zane have similar tastes, but where Zane prefers Patek, Russell loves Lunga. So I love that you know blend of the two together at the end. <laughs> and Eric's saying Jesus wept. So what do we look at first? Let's have a look at the Zeitwerk. This movement has so many parts. I don't, does it even have, I think it has a fusé chain. Might be wrong there. But as a piece, uh, it's super complicated. To get the simple digital effect on a dial has never been done before. And that's what made them stand out as a, as a family when they introduced it. The complication has something like 500 moving parts. I think it is just so, so, so well done. Uh, of course, the engraved balance cock makes all the difference. Uh, this being a much larger, I think it has a it has like an eight-day power reserve. 
no chain. Thanks, Russell. Uh, it has like an eight day power reserve, I think. And you know, it's all down to the gearing, the way it delivers the power. What makes the watch special is because, I mean, it, it needs a, it actually needs a lot of drive to run it. Just think about it, pure mechanics. You need a lot of drive to run a full set of discs every minute to rotate. And all of that adds. So you do need a lot of power as with regards to the spring, the main spring componentry and everything else. <clears throat> and then we jump across to the Z data graph. And Z data graph does such a good job here. Now, last show, last show we looked at not only the data graph, but also the Patek 5370. No, and I think these were both sent in by, by Russell. And we had a good look at see how Swiss and German approaches differ so much. And the way the Germans attempt to do their, their movements here is they, they make the components a lot more heavy duty. You see that the, the added, it's not, not the highest res from my side, but hey, you get the idea. The thickness of the components compared to the Patek double split, or was it a single split? 5370p. Uh, it's a little bit more beefier, a bit more chunkier. But as a pairing, I mean, many just say you should wear this watch backwards. You don't need to, uh, you know, wear the face at all. You want to see the small little atmosphere inside. Look how overbuilt it is. I know Neferion is so overbuilt. Okay, so Russell did an amazing job sending these pieces in, but he did send a message to me telling me that Zane has taken the cake this week with the watch that he picked up. And it is truly a masterpiece. I'm not just uh, saying that to blow smoke up Zane, but I will say that this watch that he's picked up is, uh, it's beyond a grail for many. Are we ready? Are we ready? Patek reference, 5271P, perpetual calendar chronograph, full set diamond layout on it. And as we've spoken about before in the past, Patek knows how to do diamonds on their watches. And even for someone who doesn't like diamonds and the arrangement, this watch manages to exemplify Patek's approach with arranging baguettes on everything. I mean, you see around the bezel, you see on the lugs, and let's not forget perpetual calendar chronograph. So this is the next level above and beyond the perpetual calendar chronograph, just the standard. This being in platinum with a full diamond set. I also really enjoy the aftermarket strap. I don't know if it is, but this is most definitely the mic drop for the show because it is just something to behold. And we have to all congratulate Zane. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is something something pretty unreal. And Reed's saying, every watch you reviewed tonight is a winner. Yeah, Reed. I mean, that's it. I mean, you shouldn't judge a watch by its price, by uh, what it costs. It's down to the value and what you appreciate. And, and Russell also mentions loves the black date window. I mean, is this what they are now doing? Is this an approach they're now taking? I love it too. Nothing beats black on black when it comes to date windows or white on white. The fact that you don't actually see the, the arrangement at a glance, it's out of the way. And this being a perpetual calendar chronograph, you could wear this every day and don't worry about changing the date, February, because of the fact that it does take leap years into account and quarters. Yeah, it's, it's the full enchilada when it comes to complications. But again, this, this is another level. This is real artistry. This is taking the, the level of complication to the next extent, but also adding the way they've done the diamonds and everything on top of it. It's just gorgeous. It is stunning. And, uh, and see, Mark says, hate to say it, but that's a mic drop. Yeah, it sure is. It really is. This is, this is the big deal. Uh, can't beat factory diamonds, as Megan says. Combined with the beautiful Patek, Zane takes first place again. Yeah. But this is not a competition, people. We're not in for a race. We're not in for a challenge. This is what everyone likes to wear and enjoy. And I hope through this exercise, we get to see a much rounder impression of what people like to wear and what they like to uh, invest their money in as well. I mean, this is the price of a very nice house, as most of us know, as is the two lungas that we've just seen and many others, lungas earlier on and breguets and all the rest. But uh, the strap as well. If Zane's in the chat, it'd be nice to know if this, uh, if this is aftermarket or not. I'm pretty sure it is. Aquamarine, that seems to be the underlying theme that we've been looking at over the course of the show. But uh, yeah, 
to all of you who have been a part of the show, it's always a pleasure and I love doing this. And I hope you've enjoyed the uh, pieces on offer that we've seen. So what should we do? I think that's calling it for an evening or wherever you are in the world. Been running the show for three hours, 25 minutes. Quite a nice change of pace. Not the three and a half hour mark, but uh, <laughs> better than six identical Calatravas. Yeah, it is. Shaitan, I agree. It sure is. Uh, Zane Don Johnson, Megan says, that's so funny. So Zane says, not a factory strap, baby blue alligator. I put it on the 5370 on orange gator. Oh, I remember you shared it with us. Like the casual look. Yeah, it sure is cool. Yeah, we're talking a full diamond set, platinum perpetual calendar chronograph. This is the top, this is the top of chrono complications in general. What comes next? I don't think a tourbillon matches this. Uh, minute repeater, nah. I mean, it's how practical are they compared to a watch like this? That's what I love, actually. You're not only dealing with a watch that is just blinged out, we could say, but as far as practicality goes, you could wear this watch every day, as long as you don't take it in the swimming pool or even let it look at water. Uh, you've got everything on the dial. You've got the chronograph to use whenever you need to time something. You've got the day, date, month, moon phase. If you are someone who is a stickler for that. Did 70, oh, Mark, did I miss something? Oh, no, what did I miss? 73 math. Thank you for super chat, the coffee. <laughs> I've still got some coffee here. Thank you, 73 math. Thank you so much. And yeah, for all of you, what is Zane says that the 5520P alarm travel time next with four crowns is a funky watch. I need to have a look at that. Is that the, um, that's not the, the Cal pilot Calatrava, is it? I think I'm making a mistake somewhere. But uh, 73 math saying another Brill stream. Thanks. It's a pleasure. Really having all of you being a part of the show and communicating and chatting amongst yourselves. It always makes the show a treat. <laughs> that watch will outlive me. Yeah, I mean, it is incredible. So again, Thomas, thank you. Head up to my Patreon. <laughs> I need to make like a, an episode just addressing Patreon and how it works. I really don't know as it is, but I, I can't thank you all enough who just are a part of this community. We've created some small little community that seems to be working well, that we get along, we chat about whatever goes on. We get to learn, and that's the most important part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to close off this piece and close off the watches on show and just say my final goodbyes to all of you. Again, sorry about the uh, me addressing you all and then having to stop the mic during the first hour of the show. Uh, <laughs> Mr. C, underachieving Zany Poo, needs to have a watch. <laughs> yeah, Zane, I don't know what art you have to say about uh, that pattern that you just picked up. That might be quite a, a disaster. But thank you for the $1, Mr. C. It's always appreciated. Um, and coming next week, we're featuring a special guest. We're actually speaking with someone on the show as it is. So there's going to be lots of banter. We're going to chat about all sorts of things. And we're going to be looking at Grail watches and what that really implies, what that means. We've just ended on a Grail watch, which is just fantastic. Tao, <laughs> hello, fellow watch enthusiasts. We've just finished after, uh, you know, three and a half hours <laughs> as it is and read I'm the master and marathon man yeah I'm definitely not Dustin Hoffman but uh, yeah thanks for the thanks for the compliment as it is everyone thank you so much for being a part of the show and for joining I hope you enjoyed it come next week we're chatting about grail watches with a guest and we're going to have a lot of fun together as always come next week we're going to be putting a video up on salmon dial watches and going to work through a few more everyone stay safe look after yourselves and Megan and everyone else who's joining. I think James is probably in the background there too. James, thank you for watching the show if he's not asleep by now. Uh, and one more thing I'll mention, if you are just catching the show now, the full replay is only going to be available 24 hours after the stream. Last thing, last final uh, call, because YouTube is not taking, is not finding these, these shows important with regards to uh, live streams and they're putting them on the back burner, it seems like, for processing reasons. So 24 hours, so odds are Monday, come Monday, you'll be able to see the full show in its entirety. Uh, sadly, I really don't know why, but it was impl implemented two weeks ago. Maybe it's changed since then, no idea. Matt saying, fantastic show. We all love your content, that's why we keep coming back. Thank you. I hope you also love the community. That's what also makes this a joy. So yeah, as always, keep safe, uh, have a fantastic weekend. I'll catch up with you in the community posts as always and look after yourselves. I'll see you in the next one, ladies and gents. Cheers for now.